This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Die Castinator, Chuck K45, Miles Garrett, and King GTA 15. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I can't fully express my gratitude for. Thank you all so much. My extra generous executive producer tier patrons also get the opportunity to promote some of their own content in these videos, and this episode is brought to you in part by my executive producers Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything, from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment, fixing it up, and starting a new farm from scratch. And Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying, selling, and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description down below. Thank you to all of my patrons, and please consider signing up if you enjoy my content. Every little bit helps, people. Even if you can't support me financially, though, support the show by showing my executive producers some love. And without further ado, enjoy today's video. Howdy, and welcome to the Game Vault. If you're new to the series, the premise here is that it's part playthrough, part review, and part retrospective. So without further ado, we're going to jump into a game that is, as of today, assuming I actually managed to get the video out on time, a full decade old, and see how well the single player holds up after all these years, as well as sit in desperate anticipation of the next entry in the franchise. So we open up with a prologue which takes place nine years before the events of the main game, and in the same year that GTA San Andreas released, in the GTA Universe version of North Dakota, presumably. North Yankton. We play as a man named Michael who is robbing some cash depot with two other assailants, one of which is another protagonist whom we can control, Trevor. We blow open the safe, grab the cash, and have to kill a security guard on our way out, but when we get outside there are a ton of cops standing in our way. We're given the choice to push down the road as either Michael or Trevor, which slightly changes the cutscene as you get into the truck, but once we're all in, all we gotta do is follow the road until we hit the roadblock, and then make a sharp turn to the right to barely avoid the truck. You guys all right? Come on! Ditch the car, all right? We can go this way to the chopper. No! Hey! Stick to the plan! What? Stick to the plan! Come on! Where the is the chopper? I'm gonna check around back. Alright, Brad's gonna be fine. We gotta get the out of here. Out of here! Oh, Jesus! T, you gotta get out of here! I'm gonna leave you, Mikey! Go! God, I'm not gonna be. I'm gonna bleed out. Go! Go! We can hold out here as Trevor for as long as we want, but eventually the next cutscene triggers. Trevor runs off as the cops chase him, and Michael is presumed dead, along with the third guy, Brad. Cut to the next scene, though, and we see Michael watching his own funeral from afar as the title sequence starts, and we jump ahead nine years and a few hundred miles to the golden coast of sunny San Andreas for our first real mission. We open back up on Michael in his therapist's office in Los Santos, talking about how he's disappointed in his son, and we're left to wonder exactly what happened in the prologue. And then we are introduced to our third, final, and sort of main protagonist, at least from a gameplay perspective, Franklin Clinton, as well as the ever-charismatic Lamar Davis. They're trying to steal some cars, how appropriate, and Lamar, being the genius that he is, decides to ask around random people on the beach to find the house that they're looking to rob. One of those randoms just so happens to be Michael sitting on a bench outside Freelander's office, wondering what the hell he's doing with his life. But now it's finally on. 
Our first mission is first and foremost a point-to-point -point race, but it's not quite that simple. Right out of the gate, we are going to start to see what I mentioned several times in my episode on GTA San Andreas. GTA 5's tendency to rely on heavily scripted events in situations that otherwise seem like they are completely open. Now, the reasons the game does this are fairly self-evident. Story progression, narrative flow, etc, etc. But it is still fairly annoying when it often feels like there could have been a happier compromise. However, that compromise would have almost certainly meant a less cinematic presentation. Less Hollywood, and, well, given our setting, they may have ultimately made the right call. We'll see. This is a topic that will come up many, many times throughout the video. So we race Lamar from the beach house to Simeon's dealership, and it is technically possible to beat Lamar to the first cutscene, but only if you already know the exact path to take, since your goal here is to simply follow him. It's also worth noting that you can only beat him if you make heavy use of Franklin's special ability, so let's talk about that quickly. All three main characters have their own special ability. We'll get to each of them as they come up, but for now, Franklin's ability allows him to slow down time while driving, while essentially maintaining full control and even gaining the ability to make sharper turns than would be physically possible. It's honestly a lot more fun to just cruise when the game gives you a section like this. Your first time around doing missions like these are the best experiences, since you don't notice the scripting nearly as much, maybe not at all. When you do this mission for the 900th time, though, the fun comes from trying to cheese the game as much as possible when you already know what it's going to do. This mission is a great start, though, since it gives us a nice wide look at the sections of the city we'll be spending time in for at least the next couple missions. Now, I am not an LA resident, but I have been told by my friends who lived in Los Angeles their entire life that Los Santos is an incredible take on the city, and captures the city's feel in an uncannily effective way. This mission, and a lot of missions in GTA V, feels like the first in an attempt to really show that off. In fact, a whole lot of GTA V feels like a tech demo. No, wait, that's not right, that's not what I mean to say. It feels like GTA V was frequently trying to show off just how far the technology had come in only the five years since the release of 4. 4 had some of this too, but in 5 it really feels like they wanted you to know that this was the new standard, something I imagine the next main entry in the franchise will likely repeat. Once we finally get to the first checkpoint at the end of the point-to-point -point race, we are given our first open objective, so to speak, lose the cops. And things have certainly changed a bit since the last game. See, in the old days, wanted levels were simple and very straightforward to get rid of. You had stars, go to a pay and spray, or find bribes around the map. Starting with GTA 4, however, they implemented an entirely new system. Now when you had the cops, a circle would appear around you based on how many stars you had, and like before, based on your stars, you would receive different levels of police attention. To escape them, you could still go to a pay and spray, but you could not be seen entering the building by police. And you could also lose the cops by simply avoiding the police patrols shown on the minimap and driving outside of the circle for long enough until they gave up the chase. In GTA 5, it works similar to 4's, but now the whole map will start flashing when you have been recently sighted by an officer. And in order to escape, you need to simply get away from any officers nearby and stay away from any other cops long enough for them to call off the search. So to lose the cops here, all we gotta do is stay away from any individual officers or patrol cars long enough and we're home free. However, security guards at certain buildings or just cops on the street can always spot you, starting the timer over for losing them once you're out of their sight again. Eventually, we shake them and have to pull back to Simeon's dealership for our next cutscene. All that's left for this mission is driving to the house that Franklin shares with his Aunt Denise and getting one of the most meme video game scenes of all time. What's up? Can a low come up in your crib? Man, fuck you. I'll see you at work. Oh, nigga, don't hate me because I'm beautiful, nigga. Maybe you got rid of that old yee-yee-ass haircut you got, you get some bitches on your dick. Oh, better yet, maybe Tanisha will call your dog ass if she ever stop fucking with that brain surgeon the lawyer she fucking with, nigga. What? Oh, motherfucker. But now, we are truly free for the first time. The world is ours. Tony Montana, eat your heart out. Before we jump into the next mission, though, I took some time to really appreciate the game's graphics and environment. Now, technically speaking, even though this video is meant to be on the 10th anniversary, it isn't the 10th anniversary of this version. See, GTA V originally released in September of 2013 for PS3 and Xbox 360, the first version I would have played. But the version you're seeing now didn't release until about a year later in November of 2014. This more advanced PC version was also the basis for the ports to PS4 and Xbox One and all other subsequent ports to my knowledge. Now, my PC is, at least as far as GTA V is concerned, pretty damn good, but at least in this first session, I did not push its capabilities. 
My settings are set such that they prioritize frame rate, but with a true monster rig, you can make this game, could make this game, even back in 2014, look pretty damn incredible. And even now, 10 years later, with these settings, it still holds up remarkably well. Now granted, I do not play a lot of modern games anymore. The vast majority of what I play is at least 10 years old, and the few times that I have touched a more recent AAA game with impressive graphics like Cyberpunk 2077, it's kinda made my brain hurt. Like, I think we are at least approaching a point in graphics where it's starting to exit the uncanny valley, and when functioning correctly, really look, well, real. Now, compared to something like Cyberpunk, even on my PC with these settings, yes, GTA 5 definitely shows its age, so maybe I'm not the best person to evaluate how well the graphics have aged, but for me, this game still looks great, and it all feels very cohesive and well thought out as a world. Now, something else you'll notice in a lot of the footage is one of the features that got me to buy this game a second time on PC, after already owning it on 360, is first-person gameplay. I had been waiting to play a Grand Theft Auto game in first person since I fell in love with Halo around 2007, and to finally be able to explore one of Rockstar's worlds with a POV perspective was honestly a dream come true. To this day, I still spend a lot of my time with this game in first person mode, using third person most often only when driving, and even then only when driving cars where it's effectively necessary to go to third person. Now I may or may not try cranking my settings in future sessions, so if you see the graphics improve slightly but the frame rate dip, now you know why. So anyway. I go for an extended walk around the neighborhood. By the time I get back, I get a phone call from Simeon asking Franklin to come back to the dealership for our next mission, so let's jump into it. Repossession. Despite only working for Simeon for a couple of months, Franklin is awarded Employee of the Month, much to Lamar's annoyance. And then the two of us have to retrieve a bike in Vespucci Beach that was almost certainly bought by a Vagos gang member. When we reach the spot, we walk to the end of the alley, and there are literally only two spots to check before we're ready to give up. But thankfully, to keep things interesting, Lamar murders somebody. So we're thrown into our first gunfight, and this fight is particularly script-heavy, which is something we'll see a lot more of in the mostly driving sections later on. After we clear the place, the guy who bought the bike takes off at the end of the alley, forcing us to run back to our car and give pursuit. Knock the asshole off his bike, and Lamar takes it to presumably give back to Simeon, but when we meet up with him, he seems more keen on keeping it for himself. Unfortunately, as I get back to Franklin's afterwards, I notice one of the more annoying side missions crop up, but I figure, what the hell, it makes more sense to get it over with now, and really, it's not that bad. So Tanya the strung-out girlfriend of always-mentioned-but-never-seen JB, asks Franklin to help JB by driving his tow truck for him to pick up literally one car. Pretty sure that's not how a shift working as a tow truck driver would be, but hey, I'm not complaining. So all this mission amounts to is driving to the Davis compound, getting the tow truck, driving to the vehicle, and then lugging it back to the compound. In the future, it will get slightly more complicated, but... I hope you like that, because there are a total of three more, I believe, before the game is out, and I'm pretty sure that two of them are mandatory, as is this one, though I could be wrong on that. Now, I intended to go from that to bed and save my game, but for some infuriating reason, the game decides to frequently place new missions in front of your house, which is where your primary save location is. Granted, you can quick save in your phone, but I always forget about that, and the game really doesn't make it a big deal, and it just seems like a slap in the face, since there is often a mission marker that triggers the cutscene, but even if you can physically walk around it, they will still just trigger the scene as soon as you get close. So anyway, the mission is CHOP. Normally, I would probably do this mission after our first encounter with one of the other protagonists, but due to my attempt to save, we got roped into doing it now. Thankfully, unlike back in the 3D era days, entering a mission at a different time will just force the game to roll the clock forward until the correct time. So I guess Frank went to bed after helping Tanya, only to wake up to more Lamar shenanigans. What kind of shenanigans? Well, a kidnapping, apparently. See, if you hadn't gathered it already, one of Lamar's main shticks is that he still very much enjoys and wants to participate in gang culture. Not only for the foolish dream of one day making it big, but more importantly, he just seems to enjoy it, whereas Franklin very much does not. Franklin wants to get out of the hood, a lot like CJ back in San Andreas, only even more ambitious. CJ seems to have kind of fell into being a multi-state entrepreneur, but Franklin, on the other hand, seems to have that in mind for himself from the start. And he has had that mentality for some time, despite constantly being dragged back into gang violence by Lamar and the other gangsters that he surrounds himself with. This mission is Lamar's latest scheme to get rich quick, and involves kidnapping a high-ranking Bala's gangster we only know as D, and then ransom him back to his gang for $40,000. Franklin is immediately skeptical of the plan, and seems to expect that it will fail much like Lamar's other schemes, but also goes along anyway, and pretty quickly, predictably, things go sideways. 
We end up finding Dee hitting on some girl off of Vinewood Boulevard and start a chase with him across town, with him driving a speedy bike and us somehow keeping pace with him in a crappy pedo van. Using Franklin's abilities here again makes it pretty amusing since you could very easily catch him and probably knock him off the bike, but the game attempts to desperately keep you on the rails that it's set in place. When you reach the end of this alley, your van will come to an unnatural stop as Dee is struck by a bus, and then you have to finish the chase on foot with Chop taking point and running after him. We chase him through the train yard and come upon a feature the game continues to try and push in the tutorials, but which has effectively been retroactively made pointless. Training Chop. See, after D gets away in a cutscene, you're supposed to rely on Chop to sniff him out and slowly, very slowly, open up these containers until Chop gets a bit distracted chasing Tail. The game will then remind you that you can, or at least you could, train Chop using the iFruit app on your actual smartphone. But as far as I know, this app no longer functions as of sometime last year. Thank God, too, because I don't remember anything substantial ever coming from this feature, and it ends up feeling a bit Nintendo in the Wii U era, or like Xbox Connect, with the prompt to use external mobile phone applications. At least there isn't really anything else like this in the game. Once we actually find D, we load him back into the van and drive him back to Franklin's house, but about three quarters of the way through the drive, you're meant to be stopped when Lamar makes a phone call to ransom D from inside the van. Franklin, knowing the cops would trace their position using the call, gets angry and tosses the phone out of the car to destroy it, and makes the call to let D go, and avoid attracting way more police attention than either of them are prepared to deal with. We drop off a very displeased Lamar and conclude the mission with a very anticlimactic ending. We will, however, get a bit more of a resolution to that plot thread, if you will, later on down the line. Before heading into another mission, I drove around South LS again for a while as Franklin, and ended up getting rid of his yee-ass haircut, finally, by magically growing cornrows at the local barber shop. And a goatee, but don't worry, it's not evil alternate universe Franklin, he only shows up in GTA Online. Anyways. Next, I ran into a friend of Franklin's, Hao, who introduces us to the first of several race series across San Andreas with the mission Shift Work, which is just a simple two-lap race. Now, races as Franklin are a joke. I mean, they're fun as hell, because you get to abuse Franklin's special ability and go way faster than you're intended to go normally, but because of that same special ability, there is little challenge in any race when you use Frank, unless you purposefully handicap yourself and don't use the slowdown power. After that, I wandered around again a bit, this time on foot, and walked my ass all the way over to this parking lot where I stole a station wagon in order to drive a few blocks down the road to our next mission, and a very important one at that. Complications. So at the end of our first mission in the game, we were introduced to the son that Michael spoke about in the opening cutscene after the introduction, James Jimmy DeSanta. Jimmy was conned into financing a yellow SUV, and now, like a day or two later, Simeon already wants us to repossess the vehicle, worried that he will do more damage to the car than they'll be able to get out of him in the exorbitant interest rate payments. So off we go to infiltrate a Rockford Hills mansion and bring the car back to the dealership. Okay, so regular viewers of the Game Vault will already know that I have frequently harped on GTA V for often being overly linear in its mission design and having an over-reliance on heavily scripted sequences. While even if that holds true in a lot of cases, there are still plenty of missions that do still offer that old-school GTA-type freedom, and this mission has some of that with how you go about entering Michael's property. Now, the intended way and the way the game pushes you to go is to pull up up front, hop the fence, and then take out the gardener before walking around the side of the house to climb up to the window. However, you can actually enter the property from the other side by climbing this specific part of the fence and then just go right for the gardener's truck and enter the house. Now, the game, more than just never telling you that you can do it this way, also heavily directs you to do it the normal way. But at the very least, the option to do it like this is still here. Once you're inside, you have to go out of your way to be spotted. Just stay crouched and walk downstairs into the garage where... Hmm. What's this suspicious-looking lump in the back seat? Oh well, off we go. So halfway through the drive back to the dealership, Michael Myers here pops up in the back seat and puts a gun to the back of Franklin's head. Now the game lets you hold a button to see a cinematic view during this where Michael is clearly visible, but you can't actually drive with the camera like this, so it's kind of weird. It's made even weirder that you'll see later in missions, sometimes they do this and make it so that activating the cinematic camera automatically drives the vehicle, but for some reason here it doesn't and you can only glance back and forth at the real scene while driving, which is a shame because the whole thing is animated. Michael tells Franklin to drive the SUV through the front of Simeon's dealership, otherwise he'll shoot him and do it himself. Well, I guess it's back to being unemployed then. Man, shit! No! Franklin! What the fuck are you 
doing? And then we get our first switch to Michael, where we get to beat the ever-loving crap out of old Simeon here. So, I was free-roaming as Michael next, and since, well, he didn't exactly drive to the dealership, I ended up taking a cab to my first Strangers and Freaks mission as Mr. DeSanta. On the western edge of LS, near the freeway, we can find this woman who is really, really amped up to foot-race somebody, and it just so happens that we've got an aging, desperate-to-prove-himself protagonist right here, so it's time for a little race. Now, much like San Andreas, in GTA V, each of the characters has stats that can be improved over time based on your actions in the world. One of those stats is stamina, which affects how long you can run at top speed before you can start to take health damage from it. Now, Michael, being a man who is not exactly in tip-top physical shape, has rather low stamina starting out, which is when I did this mission, and doing it this early makes it a lot trickier. If I had spent time increasing my stamina stat before this, then the race would have been a breeze, but as it stands, I actually got my first mission fail here when trying to push myself during the final stretch, causing Michael to trip. But the second time around, I washed my stamina a lot closer and used it more efficiently over the course of the race to just barely squeeze out a victory, but Marianne here was not happy about it. Then I stole a car that I liked to look up in the parking lot and was going for a little joyride when I once again spotted the love of my life. So I pulled up in front of him and... What the... F oh, no, 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 Sir, I am very sorry, but I need to commandeer this vehicle. You wouldn't want to stand in the way of destiny, would you, sir? Come on, bro. Time to move. Brought it down to the mod shop and gave it a few upgrades with what little money that I had, and then drove it back to Michael's to store it in the garage. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. Just let me... Uh, dude... Where's my car? What in the fu- So, hopelessly depressed over the loss of yet another saber, I made Michael spend a bunch of money on stocks and then join a cult. So, you may remember the comedic Epsilon cult from the original GTA San Andreas, which was the Rockstar Universe's poke at the Church of Scientology. Well, they are back in full force in GTA 5, and more than that, they actually have a more prominent role with their own mission thread, which we can start right here by participating in a nonsense survey, and then donating some money later on. I can't remember specifically how this works, I may have actually double donated when I didn't have to, but hey, I'm not bothered. I switched back to Frank at this point, and tried to participate in another race by going to the flag on the map after shift work, but as it turns out, it's just replaying that same race again. I did get an extra few bucks out of it though, so that's nice. Then I headed back to Franklin's to find Tanya hanging around looking for some more free sympathy labor. Before I could even get over to her crazy ass though. Oh, look at this fool. Get out of here. Oh, we got a fighter here. Sir, your glasses offend me. Take them off. I said take them off. Oh, wow. You still want to go. Dick kick. Dodge. And done. Well, uh, I guess it just killed my first person as Franklin. I mean, realistically, I don't know how this guy died from that, but, uh, well, he started it. I mean, actually, I started it, but, um... So, Tanya, again. There isn't much to say here. It's another Tanya mission. Tow truck action at its finest. Yay. Really, the best part about all these missions is getting to hear more about Franklin's backstory through his expository conversations with Tanya. We learn that they at some point had a relationship, or at least messed around with each other, and we'll learn more later on. Surprisingly, pretty much all of the Pulling Favors missions are available early on in the game, before even unlocking the third character, so we'll probably be tackling all of these relatively close to each other. Next up, yet another Strangers and Freaks, this time a new one for Franklin, with Beverly, the stereotypical Hollywood, or I mean Vinewood, paparazzi scum, with the appropriately titled mission Paparazzo. Now, I guess, realistically, Franklin is just as bad as Beverly here, or at least in some aspects even worse, since he doesn't immediately get paid for what he's about to do, or, spoilers, anything he ever does for Beverly, and yet continues to do it, though, I guess with the expectation that he will eventually get paid? Anyway, we find this guy hiding in the bushes who snaps a quick photo of Frank, thinking he's some famous actor, and after a brief exchange demonstrating Franklin's considerable knowledge of celebrity culture, Beverly is immediately distracted by an actual famous person leaving the premises, actor Miranda Cowan. For, um, some reason, Franklin decides to help Beverly pursue and harass Cowan by driving a motorcycle while he snaps photos of her in a less-than-public situation inside her limo. Halfway through the chase, a rival photographer shows up, but I knew he was coming and abused Franklin's slowdown ability to take out both him and the driver, like, right away. Doing this puts us into the last phase, though, where we have to lose the cops and then drop off Beverly once again for no actual payment. I mean, technically, he gives us the bike that we were driving, 
but I mean, I don't even know if we can actually sell it. And even if we can, just... Ugh. Oh yeah, and on the way back from Beverly's mission, I got a text from Tanya asking me to call her, which begins the third Favors side mission. It's just more tow truck shit, but this time we don't even get Tanya to have a conversation with and learn things about Franklin's past. Instead, it's just, well, tow truck driving. Then I went home for a good night's rest. The next time I picked up the game and the next in-game day, I went for a drive as Franklin and just so happened to run into Beverly once again, this time stalking another actress, Poppy Mitchell, who is supposedly doing lewd and thus for Beverly, lucrative things near a hotel off of Vinewood Boulevard. So we follow Beverly and come across a literal sex scene, which we have to film. Now, for YouTube reasons, I'm going to have to blur this out or just show something else entirely, but it's not exactly graphic. I mean, for fuck's sakes, there was a dick on screen and in your face in The Lost of the Damned, and here you don't even really see anything. Even still, it really feels like this mission exists for shock value alone, although the section that immediately follows is a bit more humorous. See, eventually we're spotted, obviously, and then we have to run to Beverly's car, and in a twist, not actually drive ourselves, but instead just keep the camera focused on Poppy while she chases us across town, hurling slurs and insults our way, trying to get her hands on the footage that we just got. Eventually, she crashes the car, and at least in the game right now, it's left ambiguous as to whether she even survives. Then Beverly leaves us, and this time we don't even get a free bike, but literally nothing, so I'm sure glad I took the time to do that. Speaking of crap that I wish I didn't take the time to do, yet another Tanya mission came after this without Tanya, which means I went and did more tow truck work. Well, work implies I was getting paid, and I was not. I then switched back to Michael and drove over to Legion Square to do yet another Strangers and Freaks mission thread, this time Grassroots, which takes comedic aim at the legalization of marijuana in California. I mean San Andreas, which, looking back, is extra funny for reasons they probably didn't intend. I also say this as a Canadian, where it's been legal nationwide for like eight years now, though, so suck it, America. Anyway, we smoke some really, really heavy stuff that is definitely laced, and then see aliens around us. You know, as you do. And are given a minigun with infinite ammo. Then we just gotta survive until the invisible timer runs out, but it's only like two minutes or so, I'd say. From there, I ended up at the shooting range as Michael, and at least started to try and complete all the challenges, but I got bored pretty quick and also realized that Michael's shooting skill is already pretty high, so it's not nearly as important to practice at the range. So we'll come back here later as Franklin. I ended up switching back to Frank, taking Chop for a walk, sort of, more like a chase, and then switched back to Michael again because enough time had passed since I'd made my donation to the Epsilon Foundation, and there was now a mysterious red bison pickup truck out in the middle of nowhere just calling to me. And then... I woke up in the desert in my underpants, a long way from home. Take me to my father, father, brother, uncle, Kiflam. Yo, peace, brother, brother. Kiflam. Oh, Kiflam. really? Oh! So I stole this guy's truck and drove back into town. See, now I needed to donate an additional $500 in order to progress the Epsilon mission thread. This is where I think I may have double paid. Anyway, I only had about 250 bucks left after losing a bunch of money on a saber that the game despawned, so I needed to double my money quick. And since the casino won't be open in universe for like 7 years or something, I had only one other option that immediately came to mind this early into the game. Taxi fares, a GTA tradition. Now, I don't know about you, but if a man dressed like this pulled up as my cabbie with the driver's front window smashed open, I'm not too sure that I would take that ride. This guy, on the other hand, has no fear. Good thing, too, because it was a bumpy ride, but I got him to his destination just fine, and made just barely enough to make another fruitful donation towards the glorious Epsilon Foundation Kiflom. Then it was back to Franklin, where I took a picture of a cat for the wildlife photography competition, screwed around jumping on top of cars for a bit, and then finally wound up back at Ammunition, where this time I went all in. I completed all of the weapon challenges with at least a bronze medal, unlocking a 10% discount at Ammunition for Franklin only, I think, and also increased Franklin's shooting skills to the point where he was on par with Michael, at least, if not even a little bit better. And after that, I went and did the final Tanya side mission, which, thankfully, she was actually in this time, so we could get another conversation with more tidbits of backstory. 
We hear about a scam that JB and Franklin apparently pulled back in the day where they tried to sell cigarettes until Franklin's grandfather found out and gave them both hell. This is also as far as I remember the last time we'll be seeing Tanya proper in the game. She will still continue to have a presence on the game's Life Invader app, which is the GTA Universe version of Facebook, but man, I don't use Facebook in the real world, much less GTA, so I don't think we'll be seeing her again. Back with Michael, I had waited long enough since the last Epsilon mission to unlock the next one. Well, really, it's just a cutscene, where we get to see one of the primary spokespeople for the organization at this level. A returning GTA 4 character, actually, Marnie Allen. So, Marnie was a one-off character who was herself one of that game's version of the Strangers and Freaks missions. You would find Marnie working as a prostitute in Alderney, and you could choose to help her out two different times, with the second encounter ending with Nico bringing her to the station to try and flee the city and go live with her parents, but, well, this is where she ended up, apparently. She gives Michael a speech about knowing nothing, or something, or being ready, or not ready, or I don't know. Oh, I'm not ready. Then, you're ready! But then she asks us for a whopping $5,000 donation to advance the mission thread, and well, at least right now, Michael actually doesn't have that kind of money, so we'll have to return to this later. For now, let's just head back home and finally jump into another main story mission with Father's Son. So Michael's wife and daughter, Amanda and Tracy, are fighting yet again over some boy by the sounds of things. So to get away from it all, as seems to be quite common for Michael, he strolls out to his swimming pool, pops his headphones in, and kicks his feet up, because he just doesn't care anymore. But then gets interrupted by Franklin, who's back to take Michael up on his sarcastic offer at gunpoint to have a beer with him one day and explain how the world works. Michael indulges Frank, having little interest in conversation with his own family, but about three steps into his attempt at hanging out with his new, awkwardly acquired friend, the last member of his family calls him. I actually ignored the call here, but unfortunately it does not create an alternate timeline where Jimmy just dies and then Michael tries to deal with the mental trauma of what he's done and ultimately drives himself over the edge. Instead, Jimmy just immediately texts us to explain what he's been doing and just what he would have said on the phone. Those sneaky developers. So we drive out with Franklin volunteering to help us to find Michael's beloved son who has been kidnapped aboard Michael's yacht, which is now being stolen and driven across town as we speak. Now, I specifically mentioned this mission in my San Andreas Game Vault episode when discussing missions that relied heavily on scripting, and it's because of this section right here. As we round this corner, the truck will spawn in and start driving up the highway, but because this is a cinematic sequence with specific moments the game needs to happen, we aren't given an open objective of, like, stop the truck without hurting Jimmy or anything like that, but are instead carefully guided to each new objective which must be completed exactly as the developers intend. Now, in a million other games, this would be in no way a bad thing. It would just be what the level or the game in general is doing. The reason it's specifically annoying to me here is because of what a lot of GTA missions were often like in the past, which is exactly, as I said, an open objective. So we have to chase the truck and get Franklin close enough to jump on board, but once he does, we can just hit the cinematic view button, and like I mentioned earlier, this is a section where the game will just straight up drive the car for you while you're in this view. Now, you do have to exit it twice to shoot bad guys trying to kill Franklin, but eventually Jimmy will emerge and almost immediately get swung off to the side by the boat's boom, just like Sweet in the last mission of San Andreas, only that was a fire truck's ladder, not a boom on a boat. Drive underneath him and let him fall into the car, and then finally catch up to the truck one last time so Franklin can jump back in, and then the game's scripted to have Amanda's car break down while the boat is driven off into the sunset. We drive the car back to Ellis Customs, where the game properly introduces us to the ability to mod our cars again a feature which hadn't been seen since San Andreas, and one that I think everybody was happy to have back, and all we gotta do is drive Jimmy home after that, as Franklin, to complete the mission. This also unlocks the friendship mechanic like in GTA 4, with Jimmy being Frank's new friend, though I bet you could have done hangouts with Omar before this, so... Next, we've got a long stretch of main story missions, starting with the mission, uh, the long stretch. Alright, see, each protagonist sort of has their own main foil, as there are arguably four total antagonists, with the fourth one being a character that's supposed to be the foil to all three playable characters. This mission is where we are first introduced to Franklin's foil, a GSF, or sorry, CGF, OG, by the name of Harold Joseph, better known as Stretch. Lamar texts you earlier in the game expressing his excitement at Stretch finally getting out of prison, but this is the first time he's actually seen, and as it turns out, Franklin is not quite as excited as Lamar. Having dreams of getting out of the hood and making something of himself, or at the very least doing his gangster bid for his own sake and not the hoods, Franklin doesn't exactly get along with Stretch, who is representative of the likes of Sweet Johnson from San Andreas, to an extent, but more overly characterized antagonistically with no redeeming qualities whatsoever, at least not shown. 
So, after interrupting one of Denise's feminist spiritual meetings or whatever, we walk outside to have a little argument with Stretch, and then hop into Lamar's car and drive on over to Ammunition to buy a shotgun with a flashlight attachment. Now, the game gives you the money necessary, but I could have already bought one before this, and maybe it would have actually just skipped this part of the mission, but the fact is, I didn't, so I had to do it now. Then we drive on over to La Puerta to participate in what Lamar and Stretch say is a typical drug deal. Upon arriving, however, we find the person we're selling to is none other than D from the last Franklin solo mission. The very same man we kidnapped and only let go because of Lamar's incredible stupidity. Well, apparently, D convinced LD that they buried the hatchet and set up this deal, but big shocker, it was really just a setup to get back at Lamar for the kidnapping attempt. No shit. I have no fucking idea what D thought was going to happen here, though, or exactly what his plan for surviving this encounter was, because a bunch of ballas show up, and immediately afterwards, Stretch just shoots D right in the face. Then it's into our first protracted gunfight through the warehouse, using our shotgun's flashlight to see what the hell we're actually shooting at. Now, I am using a controller for this, and I'm also allowing the use of auto-aim, since that's sort of the GTA tradition, but I am starting to consider just turning it off, because of how trivial it can make 90% of the combat encounters. Pushing my way through here is child's play, and there was never really any more than two ballas coming at me at one time, and eventually we make our way outside, and we just gotta switch to automatic guns and deal with the choppers, while we make our escape over the walls. Then it's just a matter of losing our wanted level, however possible, and returning to Franklin's house. Afterwards, I have Franklin grab a good night's rest, and in the morning, try taking a bike that Beverly gave me to LS Customs, where, just as I thought, you can't even sell it. Now, if we hadn't literally already been given a free bike from another mission, this wouldn't be so much of a slap in the face, but, you know, we were. So I take my crappy new bike and drive it over to Michael's house, since we've already kind of exhausted most of the side activities available to us at this point in the game, so we might as well jump into whatever's next. Well, next is a mission that, like several throughout the story, can be started by different characters resulting in a slightly different cutscene depending on who you actually start the mission as. In this case, we would have gotten a longer version explaining everything had we started it as Michael, but starting it as Franklin just has us entering the situation as confused and uninformed as he is. So Michael catches his wife Amanda sleeping with a tennis coach, something we've already seen hints at, like when we first broke into the house as Frank and he was coaching her. Furious that he was effectively paying Amanda to screw his own wife in his own bed, Michael chases the man out of the house and Franklin shows up just as Michael is storming out to continue the pursuit. Not really knowing what the hell is going on, but having come looking for opportunities to prove himself to Michael anyways, Franklin opts into helping out, and we pile into the gardener's pickup truck to give chase. Now, you can't actually stop him or catch him because the game still needs, you know, what happens to happen. So we follow him, and we get cut off by Jesse and Walt on their way to a cook, and then we have to find him already safe in a hillside mansion around the corner. Then Michael goes a little bit crazy. His plan is to use the winch on the back of the gardener's truck and tie it to the supports holding the house up, which Franklin does graciously. Then we get back in the truck and put her in drive. I love how the whole time Franklin is telling Michael how unhinged this is, but also just kind of enjoying it at the same time and laughing, all the way up to the point that the armed Mexican gangsters show up anyway. Oh yeah, speaking of which. So after we pull down the house, the coach calls us and tells us that it was not in fact his house, but a house that he was hiding in. The actual owner, and a woman named Natalia, has a very, very annoying voice, and she says that she's putting a green light on Michael and Franklin to a Mexican gang boss named Martin Madrazo, which Michael shrugs off, while Franklin tries very briefly to explain that maybe he should take it seriously. So we end up being chased by a couple of cars and have to either drive as Michael while AI Franklin deals with them, or shoot them ourselves while AI Michael drives us up a tree. My shooting here as Franklin ended up being pretty bad, which sucks because I'd actually put the time in to improve his stats at the range, but Michael still gave him shit and told him to go practice more. After we kill the dudes pursuing us, we drive back to Michael's house where Martin Madrazo personally shows up and introduces himself. Sort of. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Do you? No. Do you? You? I think so. Good. I know who you are. I know where you live. Who are you? I'm Franklin. License. Now, Franklin. Maybe help Mr. DeSanta here. Who am I? I think Martin Madrazo. Good boy. Now maybe give him a little of a background. Man, Mr. Madrazo... It... Mr. Madrazo is a legitimate businessman who was wrongfully accused of running a Mexican-American gang and a narcotic ring, but the charges were dropped. 
because of the witnesses came up missing. Smart kid. Now, Michael, got a question for you. What did you pull an architectural, significant, modernist, wonder home down the hillside in Vinewood Hills? I thought the owner was banging my wife. Well, that was a strange house for a tennis coach. <sighs> I wasn't thinking straight. Mm, clearly. Yeah. <sighs> well, Natalia will need a hotel while you finance the rebuild, won't she? Sure. Good. And I'm guessing here that it, the rebuild uh, will be somewhere in the 2.5 million range? <laughs> of course. Great. That's nice. Come on, man. Uh, Damn, you all right? Never better. So what now? Looks like I'm gonna have to postpone my retirement. Fuck. Ah, oh, man, I'm mortgaged up to my eyeballs. Look, I only know one way to make money. I'm gonna have to give an old friend a call. Lester. I think he's in town somewhere. I'm gonna have to track him down. Just give me a little alone time, all right? All right, though. So, Madrazo ultimately convinces Michael to finance the rebuild of Natalia's home, which would be somewhere in the $2.5 million range, money that Michael most certainly does not have right now. All of that means one thing. Michael is going to have to do the one thing that he knows how to do when there is some money that needs to be made. It's time to go steal some shit. So if you'll recall from my episode on GTA San Andreas, one of the big missions towards the end of that game was a massive heist on a casino in the GTA equivalent of Las Vegas. Well, that mission clearly served as an inspiration to the team when working on GTA V, since arguably the main gameplay gimmick, if you will, of GTA V, beyond the three playable protagonists, is the addition of a new type of mission, heists. Throughout GTA V, there will be several heist missions that we can approach from a couple different ways, usually, and can lead to different outcomes in the story, sort of, as well as different payouts when you complete them. Now that we need a lot of money very fast, we have to start planning our first of the game's heists, and for Michael, that means contacting an old friend. The guy in the chair, if you will, in this case, sometimes literally, Lester Crest. Now, much can be said about Lester, but as of right now, in-game, in the magical year of 2013, he's just an awkward techie who is very good with numbers and ideas, and for our purposes, a man who can definitely plan a score. Thing is, though, Michael's been dead for nine years now, so even from an old friend like Lester, he's going to need to do a favor to get a favor, so we have our next mission already. So Lester has an irrationally powerful hate boner for the GTA Universe's version of Mark Zuckerberg, Jay Norris. Well, I say irrational, but I mean, come on. If GTA Mark Zuckerberg is anything like real Mark Zuckerberg, it's probably at least somewhat rational. In order to get Lester to help us plan a score and pay off Madrazo, we'll have to take care of Norris, but not in your typical GTA fashion. This is another mission which is much more like an interactive cutscene than an actual mission, since you don't really do much of anything. First, we have to go to Suburban and buy an outfit to make us look like a techie, sort of. And then we head over to the Facebook building, I mean the Life Invader building, and we meet our first potential heist crew member in Ricky here. Then all we gotta do is walk upstairs and help him deal with his virus problem, because apparently Buddy can't be arsed to even close a bunch of pop-ups, and also his computer still behaves like it's 2004. But once we do that, we can go inside this room to the side, which isn't locked or guarded or anything, and swap out the incredibly valuable prototype phone for the one that Lester rigged. Then we can leave and head back home to watch the fireworks. Huh. Hold on a Fuck second. You. I think someone's trying to talk with me. Hello? Oh! Ah. Oh, Jesus! Whoa! Let's... Whoa! So the next time I played, I actually ended up streaming it, and I started by driving Franklin all the way out to the desert to try and take some animal photos. I ended up getting a few, but eventually my chat told me what you actually get for completing all the pictures, and I was less interested. Turns out it unlocks full access to a Kraken submarine that you can use to explore the depths around San Andreas, but as much as I do think this part of the game gets underappreciated, I do not have the patience to go around looking on the ocean floor for Easter eggs or whatnot, so I'll leave that part up to you. I also tried doing the stunt plane time trials as Franklin here while I was near Sandy Shores, until I remembered that there are essentially no situations in the main game where Franklin needs to fly. 
That's usually Trevor's bag, so I gave up pretty quick. Returning to Michael, I did some taxi missions to try and make a few bucks. I started with the intention to make 5000 bucks to pay the Epsilon Foundation, but I quickly realized that was probably going to take way too long and ended up going to therapy instead, as you do. This is the first of our potential meets with Dr. Friedlander beyond the introductory cutscene, post-prologue. If you play GTA Online, though, you'll know that the choice we eventually are given has apparently been made for us, since this asshole is indeed still alive by at least 2022. After he cuts us off right before we make a grand realization, I strike back by stealing his car. At least, I assume it's his car. And while cruising around, I get a call from my wife. And this is one of a couple missions given by side characters that can happen at various points in the story. In this case, Amanda has been arrested for being a klepto and is sitting in the back of a squad car waiting to be processed. We gotta show up, steal the car, and drive away, losing the cops as we return home. Nice and easy. A little later, I ran into a security truck carrying cash, which the game encourages you to rob if you're able to. Well, this happened earlier as Franklin too, but I didn't remember to buy sticky bombs, which you need to get into the back of the truck. So now, as Michael, I decided to just see if it was possible to damage the back enough with only an assault rifle. It didn't work out. I meant to start the next Lester mission, but when I got to his warehouse, he yelled at me for not wearing the right outfit, and I ended up driving home, killing a mugger and stealing his stolen money, and then eventually getting changed and stealing Nico Bellic's Infernus right outside my house, before heading back to Lester at top speed. Well, that was unfortunate. I had once again hoped to complete the game without dying even once, just like I said at the beginning of my San Andreas episode, but that dream once again died pretty quick, at least for Michael. When I did eventually make it back to Lester to do the mission, I realized it was the mission to case the jewelry store, and only after going all the way through it did I remember that you have to pick your crew at the end, and long story short, there's an additional optional crew member that I missed who I wanted to recruit, so I ended up reloading a save and may have also reverted Michael's windshield somersault. The person I wanted to recruit is good old Patrick Packy McCreary, a fan-favorite character from GTA 4 who worked extensively with that game's protagonist, Nico Bellic, back in Liberty City, but who now lives on the West Coast trying to find scores and stay alive. We can find Packy either as Franklin or as Michael, as he's robbing a store with an accomplice. When we show up, we can give them a getaway ride, or, as I did when I first played this on stream a few months ago, accidentally kill him because I didn't realize it was Packy. Once we escape the cops, we can drop him off, and Packy becomes an option as a gunman in all future heists, including our first one. So now, finally, we can go case the jewelry store. Actually, casing the joint is pretty simple. Just walk in, take a picture of the important things like the vents, keypad, and security cameras, and then climb up to the roof to get a good look at the building's ventilation system, which we can use to our advantage. Once the place has been scoped out, we just gotta select our crew and start getting ready. The crew I picked is the one that I intend to stick with whenever possible throughout the rest of the game, so I took Kareem as my driver, Packy as my gunman, and Ricky as my hacker. When you use crew members with a lower skill level, they can level up as you do additional heists, so the best thing to do is pick low-level ones here in the start, and then let them level up by the final heist. The only real downside to using Ricky here as our hacker is he gives us slightly less time to grab the jewels, but we won't need it, so... Back with Franklin, I ran into another random encounter, and one that I'd never done before. This construction worker gets pinned inside of his truck, and we have to use a bulldozer nearby to clear the rubble and get him to safety. Well, have no fear, buddy. Franklin Clinton is here. Huh. Well, that's my second death, and now both Frank and Mike have died at least once. So... Well, after a violent crash through his front window, Michael was ready for a little R&R at this point, at least in the beginning of the next mission, Daddy's Little Girl. The mission begins with Jimmy trash-talking in his video game upstairs, which annoys Michael to the point of confrontation, and well, with Michael, confrontation ends like this. What the fuck? So now we're gonna go for a bike ride with Jimmy by driving down to Vespucci Beach, where we actually have to beat him to the pier on the bike. Well, I say have to like it fails the mission, but actually you just get a different cutscene based on who gets there first. I actually lost to him when I played this on stream last time because I wasn't paying attention and crashed my bike, giving Jimmy a head start, but I wasn't about to let him win again. When we do beat him, though, he reveals the real reason he was prepared to go on a bike ride, because Tracy is out on a yacht just off the pier with porno producers, which, as Jimmy predicted, gets Michael very upset. So I guess if you live in LA or LS, you always just wear swimming trunks under your normal clothes, because in the blink of an eye, Michael is down to his trunks and leaping off the pier to swim out to the yacht and find Tracy. Now, I'm not saying that what follows here doesn't make the guys who chase us the bad guys, but, I mean, just look at this scene. Plus, we're taking you out of here. 
Dad, you're embarrassing me. These are my friends. Yeah, you're embarrassing her, dude. They're shooting porno here. They shoot porno all over town. Mom rented our house to them last summer. That was what? Our house? Yeah. Man, you got a killer pad, Mr. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? Let's go. <laughs> Those walls can talk. You think I do it? Hey. No. Hey. Shit, hey, Daddy. cool, man. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> hey. Fuck, <laughs> man. I like that. What's the problem? You're such a jerk. Come on. Dad, you dumbass. These guys are serious. Yeah, well, so am I. Talk to the seat of my fucking boat. Oh, motherfuckers. Get on, now! I'm about to skin you alive! God damn it! Go! Michael shows up to the boat uninvited, climbs aboard, and assaults several people, including pushing one overboard. Now, when we flee, they chase us on jet skis and try to literally kill us, but up until Michael showed up and went insane, they weren't actually doing anything wrong. Anyways, now we have to either kill the guys following us, or if we want Tracy to be slightly less mad at us, just escape them without killing them and then bring her back to Jimmy waiting at the beach. What a great day with the kids. Then Michael ran a decathlon, because fuck it. I was going to make him do another one all the way out near Sandy Shores, but on the way there I ran into one of the heist setups. Oh yeah, so I chose the smart approach for the jewelry store heist, which means we'll need a few things before we get started. The first thing we grab here are some canisters of knockout gas, but I have this weird obsession with playing this game in first person a lot, and it made trying to shoot this driver while also on a bike and trying not to crash very difficult. Thanks to Michael's bullet time, I eventually managed to get the truck and also kill like four cops in the process, which nets me quite a bit of attention, so then I spent a ridiculous amount of time losing them, driving around with a pop tire. I ended up using my tried and true method of doing exactly what we'll be doing in the actual first heist using this tunnel underneath one of the freeways, which the cops almost never enter. The only problem was this truck was pretty tall, so I just had to hope that I wouldn't eventually hit a section that I couldn't pass. Fuck. Well, at least I had lost the cops by then, so after turning all the way around and heading back the way I came, I now only had one more heist prep to do, so let's go get it done. And immediately after delivering the gas canisters to Lester at his garment factory, I headed down to the docks to find our next piece of equipment, another van. This one will actually drive, though, an exterminator's van. So we're going to enter the building Walter White Season 5 style and make it look like we're just there to clean an infestation. And I have to point out here that unlike some of the more linear story missions, the heist preps are some of the most interesting missions in the game, since basically all of them are, like this one, fairly open-ended. We can approach this situation however we want. Run in guns blazing, sneak around and try to escape without killing anyone, or do what I did and sneak around back, kill the one guy loading the stuff into the van, and then drive out back without anyone being the wiser. With that complete, we are now ready to take on our first heist. So, for the smart approach, Franklin and Michael go together in a car while the rest of the crew takes the truck and van. I will say, it's a bit disappointing because with the other approach, everybody loads into a van together, and we get a bit of dialogue introducing each member of the heist, but here we just get standard dialogue between Frank and Mike. Once we get there, we gotta climb up to the roof as Franklin and throw a canister of knockout gas into the building's ventilation system, and then it's showtime. Now, you have a window here to collect all the money you can based on the hacker you chose, but like I said, you don't need the best hacker to get all the jewelry inside. Just be quick about it, use the minimap to see where all the cases are, and you could probably get most of them yourself without even relying on the rest of the crew. Well, we're loaded up, boys. Let's get out of here. And we're off. Now for the escape. Playing as Franklin here, we get our first taste of a massive scripted chase through the city, but it doesn't actually last too long, as we're only headed for that tunnel that I took earlier, where we'll be able to shake off most of the cops. If we'd chosen the best driver, we would have had dirt bikes, but while the characters make a big deal out of the bikes not being able to handle the dirt, it really makes, like, no difference. There's no time limit down here, and you aren't being chased, so it's effectively a non-issue. When we get to the end of the tunnel, we're switched back to Michael automatically, and then get to use the power of this big-ass truck to smash through several cop cars, which is probably my favorite part of the mission. And then, eventually, they give up the chase as we reach the end of the Ellis River. Well, we don't immediately get our money, because the end of the first heist also marks the end of the game's first act, so knowing that, I spent some time making Franklin do a decathlon this time, and taking a few more pictures of animals, but eventually, we have to start the next mission, and not only meet our third and final protagonist for this game, but say goodbye to a protagonist from a previous GTA game. So when we finally make our way over to Michael's as Franklin, we start celebrating, only to be cut short by the guy who shot Michael in the prologue, and the guy who helped Michael establish his new life and identity in Los Santos under the table. Well, he spoils our fun by pointing out a glaring mistake that Michael made when quoting a very specific line to a security guard who witnessed them leaving the scene. This other guy runs out of the shop, pushes me over and says something like, you forget thousands of things every day. 
You'll make sure this is one of them. That's pretty scary. Back to you in the studio. You want to get lit now, sugar? Tre Trevor, baby, you want to you want to smoke up now? Don't do it, Johnny. Don't do it. Trevor, you been with my girl again? I'm speaking with you, asshole. Don't do it, Johnny. I told him, Trevor. I told him. We all get high. We all get high. But that don't Leave make it, it right. Johnny. Leave it. The crystal has got us, babe, but don't make it right. Don't make nothing right. Not what you're done with me. I'm telling Johnny, leave it. I ain't leaving nothing. Trevor, I'm talking to you, motherfucker. Are you? What are you saying? Fucking my girl, man. It's wrong. Well, I gotta fuck someone. You want me to fuck you instead? Is that the problem here? Take off your pants, cowboy. All right, let's, let's fuck. You think this is funny? Get them off! I told him to leave it, Trevor. I told him. Leave it. Leave it. Shut up, Ron. I'm about to fuck me a meth head, ain't I, cowboy? Get my boy sucked from his toothless gums, hmm? Fuck you, Trevor. Oh. I still love her. All right, cowboy. Hey, I know. Hey, come on. Shh. I don't mean nothing by it, man. I just... I know. I messed up. I know, cowboy. It's okay, man. Give me a hug. Yeah. Fucking shit! Cut! 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 Who the fuck are you speaking to? Who? Who? I'm talking to you, huh? You fuck! Johnny! Huh? Next time, don't get in my fucking face! I just saw a fucking ghost and I gotta hear your crap! Get up! Get up! Fuck you then! Johnny! Wait! <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Now, I'm pretty sure I've elaborated on this before, but hot take. Johnny's death here really doesn't bother me all that much. Now, granted, back in the day, for whatever reason, I never played the Lost in the Damned DLC for GTA 4. I knew who Johnny was and knew his story, but I'd only played the base game GTA 4 and the Ballad of Gay Tony, not really caring that much for the biker aesthetic back then. So I was already significantly less invested in Johnny's character than a lot of GTA 4 fans. But even if that hadn't been the case, I actually think Johnny's death here served a pretty important role in establishing just how unhinged and insane Trevor was. I think that by using an existing character here, and probably the least sympathetic among the original three protagonists in GTA 4, and least popular, we are immediately notified that Trevor is not just another protagonist, but one who should not be trifled with and one who serves more of an antagonistic role than any other previous protagonist in the series, with perhaps the exception of the 2D era protagonists. In fact, the more I observed Trevor now, all these years later, the more I realized his role in the story, or what I think Rockstar was going for. The three protagonists in GTA V seem to be at least partially representative of three distinct playstyles that players developed for the franchise over the years, as well as three different types of criminals from three different socio-economic backgrounds. You've got Franklin, who represents players who like to experience the game at their own pace, but are still ambitious to see everything the game has to offer, occasionally getting swept up in other characters' stories or distracted by something off the beaten path, but always coming back to what worked to get the job done. Not so much unhinged as misguided and deprived of more legitimate opportunities. He comes from a background of gang violence and small-time robberies, but hopes to one day be more like Michael, reputation-wise. You've got Michael, who represents the more skilled and calculated players, who excelled at complicated or tedious missions, or got the most fun out of learning how to complete those missions the most efficiently, or finding all the collectibles, but who is still at least a little unhinged. He comes from a background of major heists and has a respectable reputation, or had a respectable reputation, back in his day. Then you've got Trevor, who represents both the casual player who boots up GTA to run over pedestrians for some cheap, easy catharsis, and the players who genuinely enjoyed causing havoc and being an absolute psycho at every given opportunity the game presented. Crashing planes into densely packed areas, getting into police chases, and just generally being a nuisance. He is completely unhinged and comes from a background of poverty like Franklin, but to a lesser extent, and seems to have been forged into the lunatic that he is by child abuse and general mistreatment. I think for the people that spent considerable amounts of time with these games, we've all been each of these different types of players at one point or another, which is why giving us all three to play with is such a brilliant and creative idea. 
The seeds for this idea were planted all the way back in 2008 with a story that unfolded across GTA 4's DLC involving Nico, Johnny, and Louise. And while the comparisons aren't exactly perfect, I do still think those characters represented similar archetypes of GTA players, with Nico being Michael, Louise being Franklin, and Johnny being Trevor. Perhaps Rockstar saw it that way too, which is why, among other reasons, they chose for Trevor to kill Johnny, and not just some random character or side character from the previous games. Anyway, so now we finally have control of Trevor, and our first mission involves basically destroying the rest of the West Coast chapter of the Lost MC, although, as GTA Online teaches us, they never really go away. As soon as we start the mission, we are given an interesting little bit of choice too, with the ability to kill or spare Ashley, who can still be found weeping at Johnny's corpse as we get in the truck. I've almost always let her live, mostly just because I'm focused on doing the mission, but this time, for whatever reason, I decided to be cruel. I'd been role-playing as Franklin and Michael, trying not to do things that felt out of character for them, and that also meant not going on rampages or being a complete psycho. Now that I was finally Trevor, it was time to let all of that go. Dialogue with Wade on the way to the farm also changes depending on whether you spared or killed Ashley, which is neat. Then we get to kill both Terry and Clay, too, as we chase the van back to the camp. Although I'm pretty sure if you want to, you can let them live until you get there, at which point you will have to kill them. When we do reach the camp, it's slaughtering time, as we get our first really dangerous gunfight. Even with auto-aim turned on, I was getting killed, since I'm pretty shit at video games in general, but after my first death as Trevor, almost immediately after unlocking him, I just decided, screw it, and turned off auto-aim to make this fight even harder. It's really not all that bad, considering. It's just that I'd gotten careless up to this point with encounters thrown at Michael and Franklin being quite tame in comparison, and once I started paying attention, it wasn't hard to sweep through, kill everybody, and almost managed to kill all of the stragglers who tried to escape at the end. Then we have to drive over to Ortega, as they name drop yet more things from GTA San Andreas, with Ortega being a dealer working for the Varios Los Aztecas, Caesar's gang from that game. We're given a locked-in perspective that might as well be in a Telltale game, where all we do is drive forward to push Ortega's trailer into the water, and then we are actually given control, and given the choice of whether to kill or spare Ortega, but it's Trevor, so... Oh, that feels better! Funnily enough, if spared, Ortega will show up at the end of a later mission alongside a group of Aztecas, where he will ultimately die anyway, so... Over the course of the mission, we meet a number of characters who are all, in one way or another, subservient to Trevor. Trevor is effectively the actual bad guy for this entire chapter of the game, with the only catch being that you're controlling him. Now, that's not to say that that isn't the case to an extent with Michael or Franklin, but think of it like this. When you're playing as them, you're playing as Henry from Goodfellas or Frank in Casino. Not exactly a good person, but at least in the context of the narrative, a more sympathetic individual than the people who surround them. When you're playing as Trevor, you're Jimmy Conway or Nicky Santoro. You are the bad guy in every sense of the word. Ron and Wade are both terrified of Trevor and work for him under threat of violence. He's a self-confessed pusher who not only sells for profit, but also enjoys turning people into fiends. He's a sexual deviant who will have sex with just about anything that moves, regardless of how it feels about it, and he is at least believed to be an actual cannibal. Trevor may still get some sympathetic characterization throughout the story to make him perhaps more tolerable to play as, but if he wasn't being played by somebody as goddamn charismatic as Stephen Ogg, he would easily be the most reprehensible individual we've ever met in the GTA universe. But he's fucking Trevor. Trevor is kind of like if you'd gotten to play as Handsome Jack throughout the story of Borderlands 2. Simultaneously hating the character you're playing as for being a complete psycho, who maybe even kills characters from previous games you'd grown to love, while also loving every second of their performance and therefore being won over by their sheer presence. You love to hate him. Although in Trevor's case, he is at least characterized as slightly more sympathetic than someone like Jack, since he is ultimately a protagonist who will have to take down arguably even worse characters throughout the story. So now that I was Trevor, I wanted to really take my time like I'd done with Franklin and Michael, and so instead of immediately jumping into missions, I went about doing all of the little obscure things that I could do, and one of the first things I stumbled upon was this random encounter with two very drunk, very horny strangers. Now, as Trevor, and maybe even as other protagonists, but I don't think so, you can occasionally find strangers in various scenarios whom you can assist by driving them somewhere, giving you an opportunity to instead take them on a scenic detour up to the altruist cult in the mountains. They will reward you with a pitiful $2,000, but more importantly, give you an amusing cutscene and plenty of amusing dialogue on the way up there, as the passengers realize you aren't taking them wherever they ask to go. I find this couple at a motel in Sandy Shores and drive them all the way out there, which takes like 15 minutes total, but in the end it was worth it. 
they did at least mildly annoy me. So the next time I started up the game, I jumped right into the next main mission with Trevor, that being Nervous Ron. After doing serious damage to the Lost MC in the last mission, they tried to hit Trevor at his house, but I was too busy dealing with that couple, so instead they just destroyed the inside of the trailer. As additional revenge, and because he is still a tad pissed about learning the last 10 years of his life were likely a lie, Trevor decides to hit the Lost hangar and airstrip at Sandy Shores Airfield, with a little assistance from Ron. This mission introduces us to some of the stealth mechanics in GTA 5, which, while not exactly deep, feel a bit more functional and less jammed in than what we got in San Andreas. We have to make sure none of the guards here spot Ron while he makes his way over to a gas tank to rig an explosive. We can shoot out the lights to make it harder for them to see, but I do believe this is a case where freedom only appears to be present. I know this mission well, so it wasn't hard to deal with all the guards, but I seem to recall if you start missing too many shots or allow Ron to be seen, it may just instantly fail the mission, instead of simply launching you into full defense mode to keep Ron alive. Either way, we kill everybody and then have to rush down to the runway and start cleaning up the remainders, as things get loud. Ron jumps into the plane inside the hangar and we're put into a stationary turret section, as he very, very slowly drives us to our plane down the runway. Then we get our first plane to fly in the game and immediately are asked to do a barrel roll, but luckily I know exactly what I'm doing. We do a weapons drop over the ocean and then race Ron back to Mackenzie Airfield in Grapeseed, where we are given an introduction to another returning mechanic from San Andreas, but more like a maturation of a mechanic introduced to us all the way back in Vice City, property management. After completing this mission, Trevor has the ability to purchase this airfield to access a series of side missions, which give you easy slash early access to weapons and some additional cash flow. You also have just barely enough money to buy it, so the game heavily pushes you towards doing just that. Unlike all the other times I'd purchased the airfield, however, this time I decided to actually do all the given side missions, so that's what I spent the next like several hours doing. So I won't go into too much detail here, but suffice it to say there's actually more to these than I originally gave them credit for. There are five individual missions for both the airdrops and land drops, using either the plane we acquired in Nervous Ron, or the dune buggy just outside the hangar at the airfield. These don't have any kind of deep story or anything, but they do have a story, as Trevor works alongside Oscar Guzman to take control of the arms industry in Blaine County. Each of the first five missions have unique dialogue between Trevor and Oscar, and I think unique objectives, ranging from delivering cargo to bombing a moving train in your crop duster. Each time you complete both an air and land delivery, you get a free weapon too, as well as about 12,000 bucks, so after completing all five of each type, you make about 60,000 back of the 150,000 you spent to get the hangar in the first place. Now, unlike most other businesses, the airfield does not produce any passive income whatsoever. You have to actively be doing missions to make money, and it's not a bad way to make money, but buying it this early in the game as the game encourages you to do is maybe not the best move. The missions are fun though, and after completing them you can continue to do them radiantly to make more money whenever you need it, so it's not like completing it is worthless or anything. Now I did complete most of these with little issue, but there was one lesson I learned while doing one of the land drops. See I'd done everything the mission asked of me, collected the drop and evaded the first wave of dudes coming after me. As I approached the airfield however, the second group spawned in. Actually it wasn't a group, it was a freaking buzzard attack chopper. Now, it's probably because of my experience playing Ballad of Gay Tony online back in the day, but these things are not nearly as much of a threat as they once were. Especially when piloted by the incompetent AI, but I jumped out of my buggy and attempted to confront this threat head on. Only to terrify pedestrian and... So the thing I decided to do as Trevor next was one of the bail bond missions where we get to play Bounty Hunter and track down specific targets around San Andreas with only limited information. The game gives you a satellite image of the target's last known location, but tells you nothing about where they are by name or anything like that, forcing you to think at least a little bit outside of the box, or at the very least, search for the target instead of being led directly to them. Our first bounty is on a man named Ralph Ostrowski, Ostrowski? who is wanted for check fraud and money laundering, among other strictly monetary crimes. We can find Ralphie in the middle of the quarry by some vehicles, but I approached him in a, shall we say, less than subtle manner. Unfortunately for me, the truck only had room for one, so I had to use one of the cars that I almost crushed to get him back to mod. After that, I finally decided to actually do Cletus's target practice mission, since the last two times that I saw him by his place, I just ran over him, which incidentally, in this game just resets the mission, until you get far enough away from it for the characters to load in again. This mission is sort of a sniper tutorial, or sniper practice if you will. Shoot some satellite dishes, then shoot some tires, then some coyotes, and we're all done. 
And we can go make Cletus up near Polito Bay later to learn how to hunt elk in the wild, which is a thing I always forget that you can do. Right after that, I decided to try my luck at another bail bond mission, but before jumping into that, I spent a bunch of Trevor's money on upgrading pretty much all of his base weapons just for the hell of it. I spent a while trying to find the next target, but ultimately gave up and did another one of those stock car races. Oh yeah, I did one of those earlier at some point and earned this Burger King, I mean Burger Shot car. The thing is, in this early part of the game, you only have one vehicle storage slot for Trevor at his house in Sandy Shores. Which means, once you complete the first stock race to win this car, if you go to do the next race to win another car, you won't have anywhere to put it. And this might actually mean that you just straight up lose the first car, I'm not sure. I ended up doing this second race with the one that I won in the first race, though, and traded in the old one for the new one. I tried parking my car in the Sandy Shores airfield hangar, but I don't actually think that works. Worth a shot, though. When I drove back to collect my prize, the third race had already spawned, though, so what happened to the second car? Lost to the ether, I guess? So after that, I decided to finally tackle another main story mission with Trevor Phillips Industries, which sees Trevor attempting to secure a deal with some methamphetamine distributors from China. Well, in typical Trevor fashion, it doesn't quite go as planned, when the Aztecas, who we pissed off back in the mission Mr. Phillips, show up at the worst possible time, forcing Trevor to improvise and hide the Chinese contacts in a freezer. Very cool. Then we got to defend, and it's a pretty good fight. We're even given a grenade launcher at one point, which is always a good time. Once the Aztecas are dealt with, Trevor attempts to go right back to giving the Chinese the tour of his operation, but understandably, by that point, they'd already seen enough. Shortly afterwards, I was wandering through the desert in anger and frustration, as you do, when I stumbled upon one of my favorite types of missions in the game, and one that is exclusive to Trevor, Rampages. Now, Rampages are actually a feature that goes all the way back to the first GTA game, and I don't just mean causing chaos like in the overworld. Back then, you could do specific Rampage challenges to earn high scores, and it was something that kept appearing in games until GTA 4 when it sort of just vanished for a while before kind of making a comeback in Ballad of Gay Tony and then finally returning in full here. The name of the game here is simple. Kill as many people as possible without dying with the given weapon in the given time. Just like the old days, classic arcade style, brutal fun. That was a good time. Now I just need to secure a ride out of here. Well, that was rude. All right, let's try our luck with the next one. To cope with yet another death, I decided to cover Trevor in tattoos from head to toe and do something that I never knew you could do. Remove the tattoo that Trevor already had honoring Michael, since by this point, he already strongly suspects that Michael lied to him and has been alive this whole time, even if he doesn't yet have confirmation. Maybe it was jumping the gun just a tiny bit in terms of what he would do, but I don't know, it felt appropriate. I ended up at the top of Mount Chiliad next for, uh, some reason, and then I decided to see if I could land on top of one of the moving cable cars and, well, uh, has it stopped moving? Wait a minute, what if I... So then I learned how to hunt elk. I'm not going to spend much time on this, all I'm going to say is I don't care for this at all. And it's one of the few features that reminds me of things like the gang mechanic back in San Andreas. That is to say it feels tacked on and underdeveloped, like it really didn't need to be here. I'll leave it at that and move on. After hunting I came across this random encounter where you find a deal gone wrong and almost everybody dead or dying. If you follow the trail you'll find one guy still alive near a case telling you not to touch it and if you pick it up he says you're a dead man and then kills over. The case has like 25,000 bucks in it, which especially right now is quite a bit of money, so I ran for the hills with it, but things are never quite that easy. As you get away, you'll be ambushed by a bunch of other dudes, and it is not only occurring to me that this might be a reference to No Country for Old Men. Thank God Anton Chigurh doesn't come for us then, because Trevor might struggle to deal with that enigma. Next, I tackled another one of the bail bond missions, but I'll admit, I spent quite a while trying to find this guy only to finally find him when I realized the photos they give you are always in the same map orientation with north at the top, so after figuring that out, it's just a matter of finding the roads on the in-game map that match the picture. This target is Larry Tupper, and only two bounties in, and Trevor already knows the guy, with Tupper being a former customer of Trevor's, who went on to try and enter the market himself. Given that fact, it probably would have made more sense to just kill Larry, but I opted to try and take him in alive, since that's what I'd done the first time. Out of character? Eh, perhaps, but I think Trevor enjoys letting somebody live knowing that one day he might just finally kill them, and that entertains him just as much as outright killing somebody. 
Side note, I went to Ammunition in Sandy Shores again after this, and it was probably my third time in the last few sessions. What's interesting is that the store owner at Sandy Shores, Melvin, I think, actually has a story and a history with Trevor, and every time you come back in, he basically moans about not knowing if Trevor will even pay him this time, and asks not to be bullied. I'm not sure how many unique conversations there are, but I know there are at least three, which is a detail I really enjoy. If only the game actually gave me the option to just not pay as Trevor when shopping here, that would have been even cooler, but also probably pretty broken. So on to our next main mission, where Trevor attempts to follow up with the Chinese contacts from the last mission. When it dawns on him that they have no interest in working with him anymore, he threatens them until learning that they've made a new deal with another manufacturer in the area, his competition, the O'Neill brothers. So it's off to kill them. All of them. Ernie, Earl, Walton, Wynn, Dale, Doyle, Daryl, Dan, all of us. In a mission that is basically a rampage mission with more structure and a lot more fireworks. Well, maybe that's being a bit unfair since we do get this first section that allows for stealth using your sniper if you want to go that route, but eventually you gotta go full Rambo and charge inside to deal with the remaining guards. Inside, you kill one of their chefs, presumably, and then grab a can of gas to pour a leading trail all the way outside, introducing us to yet another new mechanic, and then we get to shoot the trail and watch it all burn, making sure to not look back at the explosion as we walk away. Ah, Mount Chiliad, a place of peace, calm, serenity, aliens, and base jumping adrenaline junkies. So the next bail bond guy was very easy to find based on the picture and description given. As you approach Glen Scoville here, he will jump and you gotta follow him by parachuting all the way to his landing point, or I guess just shoot him out of the sky, which is an option I keep forgetting that I have. Once we land, we convince him that coming with us will be a lot less painful, and drop him off with Mon for our third completed bounty. But now it's time. It's finally time to head back into Los Santos and confront the ghosts of Trevor's past. So Trevor learns from Wade that there is a person living in Los Santos who very closely matches the description that Trevor gave him of Michael Townley, and is ready to get some answers. Quick side note, Wade is very clearly a GTA Universe version of a Juggalo, but it just makes me wonder, does the GTA verse have like actual ICP or like an approximation of ICP because how the fuck do you parody those guys? Like this, I guess, but they never actually do anything with this joke. People not in the know might just think that Wade really admires Gene Simmons. Anyway, whoa, whoa. the rest of this mission is literally just driving to Los Santos with Wade while it's scripted to rain. Trevor tells Wade some of his backstory, and we're given insight into how exactly he and Michael reached the point that they were at when we first met them in the prologue. But then we get to Floyd's, Wade's cousin, and the stage is set for a not-so-friendly reunion very, very soon. So, I intended to do a bit more screwing around before initiating the actual reunion, but as soon as you switch to Michael, Trevor teleports right to his house, starting the mission, so, fame or shame. This scene when Trevor arrives is great, and filled with tension. It once again builds on the idea of Trevor being an antagonist, with Michael going out of his way to move Jimmy behind him and keep him away from Trevor, while everybody else treads lightly, as they can anyway, with a man that Michael literally faked his death to escape. Then, because the game has to happen, everything shifts. Trevor asks where Tracy is, and despite two seconds earlier trying to shield his son from Trevor, Michael prompts Jimmy to actually tell them where Tracy is. And when he learns it's down at the Maze Bank Arena, auditioning for fame or shame, Michael's priorities shift. Next thing you know, Mike and Trevor on their way together to stop Tracy from embarrassing herself or something. Let me be clear, I don't actually think that Trevor is a threat to Jimmy or Tracy. For all of Trevor's exceedingly negative traits, he genuinely seems to care for both of them and does not want to see any harm come to them, so that isn't my point. Michael, on the other hand, is terrified of Trevor and what he might do, fully expecting that Trevor could put his children's lives in danger, as he demonstrated by moving to protect Jimmy. So why would he allow Trevor to come with him to get Tracy? It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me beyond, well, he did that because the rest of the game still needs to happen, which is really just an excuse for bad writing, anyway. We find Tracy giving her performance for... Is that... Laszlo? Yep, so for those who weren't in the know, this motherfucker has been in every GTA game since GTA 3 back in 2001, but he was never seen, only ever heard. This was his first visual appearance in the series, and was a bit of a treat for longtime fans of the games. After Laszlo demonstrates that he's just as sleazy as he's ever been, Michael and Trevor chase him outside and we have to hijack a truck to continue pursuing him all the way to the mission's end. See, this is another one of those missions that's like father-son. I literally had the opportunity to shoot Laszlo right here, but I couldn't because of game. And then as you're chasing him, you can't actually catch up to him, it's impossible. Because if we shoot him, no cutscene. 
And if we're able to catch him, no cutscene at the location the devs want, the end of the Ellis River Basin. So we just aren't allowed to do those things. The thing is, I would much prefer it if, say, Laszlo had been far enough away that I had no chance of being able to kill him early on. Or if you give me that chance, make killing him an option. Or if you're going to make me chase him through the city, set the cutscene up to take place on the road or something so it can happen wherever you stop him, instead of rubber banding me to dancing your puppet string bullshit. So as the cutscene ends, and I will admit it's a pretty good cutscene... Please don't kill me, okay? Uh -oh. I'm supposed to be on a magazine cover next week! Michael shows his first sign of genuinely enjoying the chaos that Trevor brings with him, when it doesn't hurt him or someone he cares about anyway. Immediately after that, though, he phones Dave to reinforce the fact that no, he still very much considers Trevor a threat, and is actively worried about him, even if that exchange ended well. So, who the hell knows what Michael is thinking? The way Michael talks to Dave on the phone made it sound like the meeting was the next thing both of them should do. When I actually initiate the cutscene though, Michael implies that the mission which happened like 5 minutes ago was actually a couple of days ago in game, so... Egg on my face, I guess? So dead man walking. This is the mission where we are first roped into Dave's FIB bullshit, since Dave knows that Michael did the jewelry store heist, which means as far as he's concerned, their old deal is dead, and a new one involves a whole lot more backscratching on Michael's part than it ever did before. We have to help Dave and the FIB deal with some contact who they have been fighting over with the GTA version of the CIA. The IAA. God, I hate saying that acronym. So the IAA claim this guy is dead, Ferdinand Karamov. And we gotta sneak inside the coroner's office where he is supposedly being held to verify that it's actually him. Well, I say sneak in, but... I have always kind of liked you. Call me when you wake up. I'll tell you what to do. Then the mission is just waking up, retrieving our weapons, and shooting our way through the building, but we have Michael's special ability, which means it's a piece of cake. The real fun part is losing the cops, and in GTA V, that can be both a super fun, exhilarating experience and absolutely fucking exhausting. This time, it was pretty well balanced. Ended up losing them on Grove Street, Grove for life. After we lose the cops, Michael phones Franklin and asks him to meet him on the outskirts of town, so that's our final objective. In the closing cutscene, Michael explains to Franklin what he's gotten himself into. He tells him about Trevor and that he's now basically working for the FIB, and urges Frank to get out of town, but Franklin is having none of it, and is prepared to stick by the guy who helped him to get the bigger score of his criminal career. Well, remember, at this point, Michael doesn't trust Trevor around his kids, but that doesn't mean that his kids don't trust Trevor. So I decided to finally give the GTA 5 Hangout system a try, since I almost never use it. Back in GTA 4, I would do Hangouts all the time. I loved all the extra dialogue in them, but here I just never bothered with them. Enough people were, shall we say, annoyed with the frequency of Hangouts in the base game of GTA 4. To the point that by the time of Ballad of Gay Tony, it had already kinda come to this. Friends don't pester you to hang out, but you can pester them if you want to. But there's not as much to do anymore. In GTA 4, there was darts, drinking, pool, cabaret clubs, strip clubs, food, heli rides, boat rides, and sometimes your friends would just call you asking for a ride. In GTA 5, you only get cinemas, shows, drinking, strip clubs, darts, tennis, and golf. And the mechanic is just overall way less emphasized, which I do understand, even if I preferred the annoying friends of GTA 4. Anyway, Trevor and Jimmy hang out, and I learned that Trevor won't take Jimmy drinking, even though he's of legal age, since he still sees him as a kid. For all of Trevor's flaws, he's surprisingly responsible and defensive when it comes to kids. I ended up having to play tennis, but Jesus Christ, how many games of tennis are in one freaking set? My God. Six games? Are you kidding me? I gave up after game five because I had enough by that point, but Jimmy still gave me shit for calling it quits too early. Like, bitch, you literally could not have won in the last game when I won the first four. So next, I switched to Franklin and made an investment. I don't actually know if it was an intelligent one, but it was an investment. I bought the tow truck company that we did like five unpaid jobs for, so now at the very least, we'll make some money if we want to tow cars when we're bored. I don't actually have the time to do that since I'm trying to get this video out by the 10th anniversary, but you know, I have it now, so yay? Oh, right, right, so the money from the jewelry store heist finally comes in by this point. So Franklin had about 300 grand, and the tow truck place cost about half that. I also tricked out one of Frank's bikes at this point, which cost me another pretty penny, leaving me at about 110,000. There is a way to make a lot of money beyond the heist that's coming up, so I probably should have waited to do this in hindsight, but fuck it, what's done is done. Then I had Frank and Lamar hang out too, which was a good time. We got fucked up. 
Then I bought the garage in Grove Street for Frank, which cost me another 30,000 bucks, and it only stores like six cars, which is bullshit compared to the amount of cars even in the base game, but whatever. Got into a massive gang fight with the Balas, because one of them talked shit, had to kill Chop's brother, cried about it, barely escaped with my life, and then headed back home to get some shut-eye. The next time I booted up the game, I spent yet more of Franklin's money to pimp out his main car, and then finally got ready to do those missions that I mentioned earlier, where we can make a bunch of money. Now, again, I really should have done this when I still had the 300,000 as Franklin, because by the time I went and did it, I only had like 4,000, and that was not going to produce much of a return, so I actually decided to reload my save from before I spent all that money on Frank's car, garage, and bike, and then did the assassination. See, these missions can all be gamed by investing in specific companies just before completing each of the contracts. Oh yeah, did I mention that there's a stock exchange, two of them in this game actually? Depending on how much you had, you can make an absolute shit ton of money. And I bet if you had waited until after the final heist to do these, you could probably really break the bank. Sadly, I remembered only after doing the mission the second time that all three protagonists, not just Franklin, can benefit from the investments, even if there's no actual logical reason for Michael and Trevor to know about it beyond, I guess, Frank just telling them. So finally, after my third attempt, not due to failure but sheer incompetence, I killed Brett Lowry with a well-placed sniper round and then ramped off the roof to safety. After selling all the stocks I'd had each protagonist buy, they were now each sitting on something respectable. I spent almost a million bucks after buying and upgrading every gun for Michael since he had by far the most money and also upgraded his car, then headed back out to the desert to finally do his next Epsilon mission now that I could since I could finally afford to donate that $5,000 they asked for. As it turns out, they now want us to steal a bunch of cars for them. Huh. How very, uh, spiritual. Oh yeah, and Michael's real name is Zolai Kiflon. After completing the hotel assassination, it also unlocks Franklin's new home in the Vinewood Hills, meaning no more bunking with his crazy aunt and niece, and it also means one extra slot for storing vehicles, which is cool. I may have, however, forgotten to turn off the option in the INI files for menu that enables the online world, so there was a little bit of a fucked up shit going on in Franklin's house until I fixed that. I'm using menu just for debugging, don't worry, I'm not using it for cheats or god mode... yet. Later, as Trevor, I ran into that same random encounter from earlier where the dude gets trapped by the pipes in his car. I couldn't remember what I did to reset this one or if it just repeats, which would be kind of weird, but it meant that I had an opportunity for redemption. Hopped into the bulldozer, cleared the pipes, and leaped out in time to avoid the explosion, but... I mean... I'm Trevor. Oh, hey buddy. Taking a load off, eh? I don't blame you. That was quite the ordeal. Well, anyway, I'll see you around. Enjoy life. Oh, come on. Come on. I'm Trevor. What followed was an epic manhunt across the state as I went from one murder to many, but honestly, when you're going on a rampage like this on your own time and of your own volition... This is where GTA 5 is at its best. Try this sometime. Go into GTA 5, go into first person mode, turn off your GPS and HUD, and then go on a rampage and try to survive as long as you can. It's exhilarating, even 10 years later. But alas, as hard as I tried, I could not escape the long arm of the law this time. But it's finally time to get started on our second heist and probably my least favorite one in the game. The Merryweather Heist. This mission is similar to the last mission we did at the start of the heist chain, where we just investigate the areas and assess our options. Trevor, having now placed himself directly into the middle of both Floyd and Michael's affairs, decides that he's going to try and orchestrate his own heist for... Trevor reasons, and when he learns that Floyd is a worker at the Port of Los Santos, he figures that he is the perfect end. We all head down to the docks, and Wade is whisked away to deal with some sewage backup while we and Floyd continue looking around. Now, last I checked, the appeal of GTA games was stealing fast or interesting cars, causing chaos, and other generally cathartic activities that none of us would ever do in real life. So why the fuck did they put in a section which requires you to drive a stevedore truck thing, whatever this is called, and a crane? Like, this is not vehicle simulator. This mission is slow, boring, and not the least bit challenging, and definitely one that I am never looking forward to doing, even if, like pretty much all other missions, it does have some pretty good cutscenes. On my way back from the port, I gave these two men a San Andreas courtesy, a free bowel evacuation, and then it ends with us having to select a plan like the jewelry store heist, and in this case we have two completely different jobs really, just both ending with the same target. I always go for the freighter here though, since the offshore option is just a whole lot more flying over the state, since it takes place all the way up in the top corner of the map, and the freighter is just generally a little bit more fun for me. 
After that, I decided to yet again just jump into the next mission with a follow-up to our last FIB excursion and the introduction of one of the game's main antagonists. Yes, one of. Steve Haynes. So the reason Dave was so eager to screw over Michael to help himself was mostly due to this man, Dave's boss, Special Agent Steve Haynes of the FIB. In our last mission for them, we learned that the guy we were after, Mr. K, was not in fact at the coroner's office like the agency said. So now they want us to extract him from the agency, whom they apparently learned have him in custody now, at their main office downtown? Maybe I'm crazy, but that seems like taking a big risk, even though we still don't know and never will know why exactly both the agency and the bureau want him so badly. This is the mission where Franklin and Trevor meet, too, since the FIB brings both of them on board for this elaborate job because they have enormous leverage over all three of us. After some awkward introductions, we're into the sky for our first taste of a mission with all three protagonists doing something different. We fly to the building as Trevor and then position ourselves over the side to have Michael rappel down. Then we have to snipe dudes from the opposite building as Franklin or take them all out as Michael, ending with a few attack helicopters pursuing you that either Frank or Michael could take care of. This mission is decently fun, but once again it's so heavily scripted, and it just makes me wish the mission gave me more freedom to complete it how I see fit, using each of the protagonist's strengths rather than just jumping from one to the next in order based on what the game says. We will get more of what I'm talking about later on, but we'll also get plenty more of this, so... Remember that guy who gave Michael a joint that made him see aliens and shit? Well, if we find that guy as Franklin, we can learn that apparently, both Michael and Trevor, as we'll learn, are lightweights at least when it comes to weed, and in comparison to Franklin. Since Frank doesn't get the aliens, instead he gets two side missions which are able to be started by simply being in certain areas while not on another mission already. Grassroots here has two of them, and while we're here I also drove over to Beverly, who sneak attacks us off Vinewood Boulevard yet again, and start his next mission, since it places two more objectives on the map which we can tackle whenever we feel like. Our first objective for Barry, the pot guy, involves moving this broken down car to his apartment, using a tow truck like in the Tanya missions, but we don't get paid for doing this, nor does the guy ever even mention getting paid, so I really don't understand why Franklin is willing to do this, or literally anything for Beverly. Speaking of Beverly, our next objective for him, or at least the closest one to me after completing the first Barry mission, was this little chase through Vinewood Hills, with our old buddy Poppy Mitchell. Since we do this one as Franklin, you can really abuse your special ability to stay nice and close to her, but you don't actually have to. All you gotta do is not lose her and be there when she crashes her car, giving you the chance to take a photo of her. Man, doing work for Beverly really makes me feel dirty. Literally right after hanging up the phone on me after sending him the photo of Poppy, we're already in Mirror Park, ready to start his next objective, which simply involves taking a picture of the Queen's granddaughter, I guess, Princess Georgina, as she purchases drugs behind the convenience store. And last, but not least, for now, was Barry's second objective, or at least in the order I tackled him. Once again, all this involves is driving this truck back to Barry's, but you do have to contend with the police in this mission, which adds something. Well, normally you do, but I keep forgetting to turn off the Never Wanted, which is on by default and menu for some reason, so there have been a couple of times in mostly side missions like this where I technically got off easier than I should have, but oh well. I switched to Trevor, which is often one of the most entertaining things you can do in GTA 5 already, and was going to go and do Trevor's encounter with Barry, but instead... I encountered the first instance where the game just straight up starts a mission for you regardless of what you were in the middle of. This is very frustrating, but once it prompts me to switch to Michael, it teleports Trevor, resulting in him showing up to the mission looking like this. We also get to meet the game's main antagonist here for the first time, Devin Weston, but he doesn't get much of an introduction yet. That won't come until the end of Blitz play. Now, this mission is controversial to say the least. By the book sees us split between Michael and Trevor. While Michael and Dave go out to find a target that Steve is after, Trevor has to hang back and... literally torture an innocent man to the point of tears. Yeah. Now, we have to do a minimum of four rounds of torture while they figure out who their actual target is, but once it's all done, Trevor is told to put Mr. K down as Steve leaves. Not wanting to do what Steve says out of principle, Trevor opts instead to release Mr. K, driving him to the airport and telling him to move on or move to a new country and spread the word safe from the U.S. government. This is where the part of the mission's intended message comes across. At least I think it was the mission's intended message. Trevor talks about how torture is really just for the person doing the torture, and how the U.S. government lies to and tries to convince its people that it works when Mr. K would have told them everything they learned without the torture. Now, this is a good message. Torture is horrible and all that, but why did we have to participate in it? I mean, there's no silver lining. Mr. K is not a hateable person. Based on what we learn, he is a completely innocent person, actually, and or at least, you know, innocent of the crimes he's accused of by both the Bureau and the agency. And at the end of this mission, he is forever separated from his family, and the whole thing is played for laughs. 
I feel like I'm missing something. Maybe 17-year-old Guinness thought it was kind of a bold move to include this, and that it sent some kind of message, but nowadays, this whole mission just makes me feel super uncomfortable. Now, maybe that was the point, but I really don't see why this had to be here. The message is hammered home, and there's no overarching reason for what we do. We torture an innocent man for fun, and that's it. It's a level of fucked up the GTA series has only ever flirted with in the past, and quite frankly, I could do without a mission like this in the next entry. It feels like nothing was accomplished with its inclusion, other than giving actual sadists an actual, if brief, torture simulator in a mainstream AAA game. So to cleanse my palate after that, I took Trevor, still wearing nothing but his underwear, over to see Barry, where he confronted a slightly different personal demon than Michael's aliens. Clowns. This one is a bit harder than Michael's survival, since you have to go out of your way to reach the clown vans and destroy them, otherwise they will never stop coming. So definitely don't just stand in the middle and hope for it to end like in Michael's. After that, I decided to get the one setup mission for the Merryweather heist out of the way, which involves stealing a sub over at the southeastern docks. Now, like most setups, there are a number of ways you can tackle this, but the only way I ever use is to just snipe the ropes that hold up the sub, releasing it into the water and allowing you to jump in and just drive it away without having to fight anyone. These things are really cool, but you can't see shit when you're driving them, and there's just not enough of an incentive to explore the ocean floor, and... What the fuck was that? Is that a killer whale? Have those been in the game the whole time? Holy shit. Anyway, we bring the sub to Floyd, who helps us load it onto a truck, and then deliver it to a warehouse nearby where it will be ready for us when we need it. After the sub was collected, we also got a text from Steve prompting us to initiate the setup for another heist. Well, sort of. Blitz play. Now, this one is debatable as to whether it truly counts as an actual heist, but whether it does or not, it functions like one. This time we have to ambush an IAA-owned van full of money that apparently they got from selling drugs, which Steve wants to use to do whatever the Bureau does. Michael pretty quickly comes up with a classic blitzplay plan, involving a couple of vehicles, some disguises, and heavy firepower to deal with the cops. And then we are let loose to collect the necessary equipment, which can, for the first time, be done by any of the protagonists. Now the question is, do I jump right into the Merryweather heist, or do blitzplay just to shake things up a little bit? The first thing I did was find a getaway car as Trevor, drove it near where the mission will end to mark the location, then it was time to switch to Franklin to wrap up another Strangers and Freaks thread. So we find Beverly doing his reality show, apparently at a place on Vinewood Boulevard, but when Franklin asks him to finally pay him for all the work he's done, he just dismisses us once again, and we are given the chance to finally kill him if we so choose. I so chose. Next, I did another street race as Franklin, which only netted me like 1500 bucks, and then did all of the setups for Blitzplay in quick succession grabbing the garbage truck as Frank, the tow truck as Michael, the masks as Trevor, and then finally back to Frank for the boiler suits. Now, as it turns out, I don't actually think you can start Blitz play before the Merryweather heist, since after completing all of the setups, it did not pop up as an option. So instead, I decided to next finish up the grassroots Strangers and Freaks by going to the City Hall to get a phone call from Barry, who is too stoned to show up to the smoke-in he apparently set up. This is not the first or last instance of a mission just kind of... ending. There's another Strangers and Freaks thread from Michael which involves finding pieces of a submarine, and that one supposedly has a secret reward of a rare vehicle, but there are honestly way, way too many instances of missions either not paying you or getting a really dismal reward for your efforts in this game, especially when compared to some of the other games. Anyway, moving on to another main mission, I decided to tackle one that's been available since Trevor got back into LS and met Franklin, and one of my favorite missions in the game, Hood Safari. So while T and F had met before this, this is their first true introduction and their first mission together without Michael. Trevor shows up at Franklin's aunt's house looking to make new friends and inserts himself into a gangbang that Lamar had set up. Well, really it's a drug deal, or it's supposed to be, and it also takes us straight down the path of nostalgia with the deal taking place at the end of Grove Street at the house where CJ's was in San Andreas. There's also an easter egg as you drive up of some dudes who are supposed to be Smoke, Ryder, and CJ, which is nice, but as I explained plenty in the premiere episode of my newest series, Game & Graphic, Grove Street is now controlled by the Balas, and while Grove Street families ain't been around for a while, Frank and Lamar's gang, simply called The Families, certainly have maintained a lot of their former rivalries that their predecessors had, including with the Balas. The deal goes wrong, because, of course, when Trevor helps to identify that the brick of cocaine they were trying to sell us was actually half drywall. A massive shootout ensues across Grove Street where we can control either Frank or Trevor, and a small gameplay problem starts to emerge. You can't make yourself completely invulnerable or anything, but by switching characters when your health is too low, you can survive a lot longer than you probably should. Eventually, we're funneled down into the LS River Basin, where a famous rapper, MC Clip, just so happens to be shooting a music video with some sea sharks. We jack their rides and flee out into the open water, 
but when the game tells you to split up, I opted to just follow Franklin as Trevor, and it led to a unique conversation between them that I had never heard before, and it was actually really neat. There's quite a bit of this in the game overall, little missable pieces of extra content, and for all the shade I have and will throw at this game, the little extras is something they did a marvelous job with. Alright, time for a story-heavy chapter with something that I've been putting off since it became available. Did somebody say... Yoga? This mission is yet another mission where there's not really any game here, and what they put in as an actual objective is lame, and I don't understand why it was even included. Michael is invited to join in on Amanda's yoga sessions, and we actually have to do a bunch of fucking ridiculous controller exercises like this is Wii Fit or some shit. Just like the crane mechanics in Scouting the Port, why is this here? My first thought is, well, they'd written this part of the story and needed something for the player to do during the mission since nothing you would normally do during a traditional GTA mission happens. This should have just been a cutscene then. We do yoga, Amanda and Michael fight, so they leave, and then Michael tries to hang out with Jimmy, ending with Jimmy drugging us because I guess he'd also had this planned, and the whole family moving out because of Michael's increasingly erratic behavior. It's a good story beat, but why did this have to be a mission? Or why couldn't whatever mission we got be incorporated into the story they wanted to tell instead of giving us this shitty yoga minigame? Icing on the cake when you finish the mission, now yoga is available in Michael's backyard, or several other locations around the city. Like... They actually thought their shitty yoga game needed to be included as a side activity because somebody out there would just be pining to do it again. Please tell me, has literally anyone ever played the yoga minigame of their own volition, on their own time, for fun? I'm going to vote no, moving on. Well, what better to do after your family leaves you than go to a therapist, and since it had been a while since I last saw Friedlander, that's exactly what I did. Now, something I've realized with him is that pretty much every encounter is like 90% based on your own actions. I could have come to see him earlier, but didn't, and which missions I have or haven't completed will actually change what Michael says to Freelander, which is another really cool little detail. What Freelander says to you also to some extent reflects your playstyle. Michael doesn't ultimately seem to get much out of it, but these little cutscenes offer a fascinating look into his psyche from the perspective of somebody in the GTA universe, even if that somebody is at least a little bit completely insane himself. And we go from therapy to stealing nuclear weapons off of government contractors at the busiest freight port in the whole country. Lovely. It's finally time to tackle the Merriweather heist, and unfortunately, there's really not a lot to say here. This heist, along with the next heist, both screw us over and ultimately have anticlimactic endings. The mission itself is alright, but it's nothing special. We once again have the illusion of freedom, with each protagonist doing something different, but really it's just jump from one objective to the next like usual. That's not completely true. You do get some freedom in deciding if you want to control Franklin while the AI plants the bombs as Michael, or sneak around as Michael and let the AI watch your back as Franklin, or switch back and forth between them. Once all charges are planted, Mike goes inside to plant the last one, and Frank has to hold out against any more Merriweather showing up. Eventually, Mike comes out, we cover him some more, and then he leaps off the north side, giving us a chance to detonate the explosives, sink the ship, and then swoop in as Trevor and the sub to collect... whatever it is we're stealing. When we grab the device, we have to tediously drive it around the corner in the sub to Floyd, where we learn from Lester that everything we just did was completely pointless. The mission ends by teasing us that the payout could have been $20 million, but instead we got jack shit. Now, this happening once, especially if there were more heists, I could get. But ultimately, if we don't include Blitzplay, there are five heists and one of them doesn't pay anything. That's really stupid if you ask me. Trevor also gets a phone call from Elwood O'Neill at this point, reminding him that he still intends to try and get even with Trevor for him killing all of his brothers. Oh, and since I don't think I've mentioned it before, there's also several times when you receive messages from Wade saying that the Chinese triads also still want revenge on Trevor for killing the O'Neills and ruining their deal. Both of those things will come back later on, though. Since I was in the area, I also did another rampage mission just before heading over to the FIB lot to start Blitzplay. This one is a rampage against gangsters, specifically Vagos and East Los Santos. There's not much to say, just more Rampage goodness. I love these. So anyway, on to another heist, which doesn't actually pay you, Blitzplay. With the Merryweather heist done, we are finally able to do the next heist, which we've already completed all the prep for, but like I said, it's arguable as to whether or not this one actually counts as a true heist. We don't get to choose a plan or even get paid, but we did have heist setups marked with the H symbol, so it's anybody's guess. Do you consider Blitzplay to be a proper heist? So Michael drives the garbage truck, Franklin drives the tow truck, and Trevor acts as lookout, and we're off to the races. Then we get a very confusing cutscene where the truck is seen heading north one second, but then for some reason comes south down this road, which if you know the area makes absolutely no sense, and no, none of these roads are one way. 
Anyway, we block the road with the garbage truck, then ram into them with the tow truck, blow off the doors to get the money, and then it becomes a horde mode, basically. The rest of this mission is basically just staying alive as the LSPD swarms from all angles, and you're free to control whoever you want, as long as you don't die. Deal with the snipers and the helicopter as Trevor, and then once all the dudes on the ground are taken care of, Franklin takes the truck to destroy it, and Michael heads off to deliver the money to Steve Haynes' contact, the guy we met earlier in By the Book, and the game's main antagonist, Devin Weston. One thing. Why is it that we feel the need to destroy the garbage truck to destroy evidence, but not the tow truck? Maybe Trevor deals with it? I don't know. Anyway, like I said, we don't actually get paid for this one, which is, once again, a giant load of bull. Michael gets a proper introduction to Weston, and he immediately puts us onto another job, which Michael thinks would be a perfect opportunity for Franklin to make some new high-level contacts. Devin also convinces Michael to be a bit more cooperative by bribing him with the promise of letting him meet one of his heroes, movie producer Solomon Richards, whose studio Weston owns. And so it's right into the first mission we do directly for Devin with I Fought the Law, which sees us acquiring the first two of five vehicles that he wants and claims he'll pay us generously for. The plan is for Trevor and Michael to suit up as police officers while Franklin eggs the two targets, some trust fund kids that Devin hates, into a street race, which will also allow T and M to swoop in and arrest them, taking the cars in the process. So the actual mission here is just a whole lot of driving through some heavily scripted traffic. I will admit though, scripted or not, driving really fast down the freeway, especially in first person, is still a lot of fun. We reach the gas station where the punks are conveniently waiting and start the race, but you don't actually have to beat them here. The only goal is to stay with them until we reach Grapeseed, at which point we take control of Michael on his police bike and have to chase them down. Trevor will urge you to try and take on the traffic in the opposite lane, but other than that it's just drive until you reach this bridge. Again, it would have been a lot cooler to me if we actually had to get close enough to them to pull them over instead of just staying close enough to them for long enough to trigger the cutscene where we take the cars. Once we have them, we're also prompted into a little friendly race back to the auto shop where we can choose which protagonist to race as and get a slightly different dialogue based on who wins. With the two cars delivered though, that's two down and three to go. Even though it was technically available before this, now feels like the appropriate time to go see Solomon Richards, since Devin technically said he wouldn't make the connect until we'd actually gotten him some of the cars. So this mission sees us play Goon with a tire iron for Solomon, who is kind of like Steven Spielberg meets Martin Scorsese. It also sees the return of a character from GTA 4, and I think now I finally understand why they were included. Because who we get isn't exactly somebody fans were pining to see return. Rocco Pelosi. Remember him? He was an Ancelotti goon back in the Ballad of Gay Tony DLC for GTA 4, but at the end of that DLC, we never actually got to kill him or have our revenge, as is pretty typical for a GTA antagonist. So I think that's why he was brought back here, to give us the chance to finally wipe that smug mafioso grin off his stupid face. All we gotta do is drive over to this building where Pelosi is negotiating a new deal with the director and starring actor for Sullivan's new movie, and sneak onto the roof without being seen. As usual, the sneak element here is really underplayed. You gotta really suck to get spotted long enough for the mission to fail, and as long as you have silenced weapons, the whole section is really easy. When we reach the roof, we get another fist fight where the game for some reason reminds us that we can do things to increase the power of our punches, but like, we're more than halfway through the game at this point. With Rocco dealt with, now all we gotta do is convince the director and actor to play ball with Solomon's demands once we get back to the studio, which means flying erratically for a little bit. Now this part I could see actually being hard if you suck at flying, which apparently lots of people do, but I am not one of them, so all I do is fly under like three bridges and boom, they're scared shitless and ready to do exactly as Michael and thus Solomon says. Drop him off at the studio, force an apology out of him like a desperate YouTuber, and we're all done. Time to grab another one of those cars for Weston. Our next mission is yet another one that I honestly have no idea why it was included. The mission involves exclusively the use of a camera to watch targets on the ground, since we're in an LSPD chopper as Trevor, armed with facial recognition technology. Once we find the guy we're looking for, Chad Mulligan, Franklin does a piss-poor job of chasing him, until we finally corner him at a parking garage and get the opportunity to either kill him or spare him as Franklin. If we kill him, we would have had significantly less problems, but I try to roleplay based on which protagonist I'm controlling, and I don't think Frank would kill this guy based on the way he carries himself, so I let him live. Doing this, though, means he will report the car stolen as you drive away, meaning you'll have to lose the cops, but thankfully, I don't actually think Devin Weston cares what condition the car is in. Well, maybe he does, but the game doesn't, or not enough anyway. I was feeling cheeky, so I actually fixed the Z-Type with Menu after this brutal wipeout. Sue me. I don't actually think it affects how much you're paid, since you aren't paid anything. 
Devin also plants the initial seeds here for the internal conflict that Franklin will develop around what to do about Trevor and Michael. It's clear that while Franklin doesn't respect Devin, he at least hears what he says because he sees himself, even if he won't admit it, as better than all of them. And he just might be. But Michael's life could use a bit more... spice, don't you think? I mean, his whole family left him, but that's not quite enough. How about we piss off a Mexican drug lord? Again. Kaida Libre, or Freefall, sees us once again working for Martin Madrazo, but this time as a favor and not under the threat of death. Michael brings Trevor in on the job, and almost instantly, Trevor falls madly in love with Martin's wife, whom he treats like actual garbage. The job is to assassinate Martin's cousin Javier, the guy who attacked Michael with a baseball bat, and will be doing it by shooting down his plane with a special gun as Michael, while Trevor follows the plane to collect the files that Javier has, and to make sure that he's dead. So we have to drive out to the observatory and get into a van, much like the old days with a remote control car, and then we're given control of this massive gun. Shoot into the little red squares three times to bring the plane down, and then we're switched to Trevor, where we have to follow it to its inevitable crash site. Once again, the chase after the plane is heavily scripted, but if you actually follow the path the game intends for you, it is a pretty good time. Reach the plane, shoot Javier, grab the files, and we're all done. Now Trevor will go and return them to Madrazo for a nice payday. What? There's been a change of plans. You don't need to come to the ranch. Meet me at Stoner Cement Works, a little up Sonora Road from there. What are you doing, Trevor? Nothing you wouldn't do. Well, that doesn't sound good. I asked for a fair day's pay after a fair day's work. Then he kind of got a little angry. So I admit, I kind of got a little angry. Did you kill him? What kind of fucking animal do you take me for? No, I didn't kill him. Oh, fuck. But I did kidnap his wife. Oh, no. Well... I guess Michael won't be going back to Los Santos for a while. Back to Franklin. It's time to tackle the third mission for Devin Weston with Deep Inside, which is a type of mission I wish was a little bit more common. The game tells you to steal a car, gives you a suggestion on how to get it, and then lets you do whatever you're going to do. Now, the intended path is to knock out this actor and steal his outfit, but I gotta point something out here. How the hell does anybody expect this to work? I mean, Franklin and the actor look nothing alike, so what does putting on this outfit even accomplish? Security will even say to you as you walk up the set that you're, like, needed on set. Like, dude, what? Now, I can't remember how it's supposed to go down, but there's some shenanigans you can pull where you steal the car, eject the actor in the side seat, and escape. But I guess I got into the car too soon or something because I had to improvise my escape. Now, I said this mission gives you the freedom to do it the way you want, but as soon as we leave, we are reminded that things need to be done a specific way, even if it's completely unnecessary and could have been done in a way that actually gives you freedom. As you leave the studio, security will chase you, but it's like in the stock car races. They will rubber band to you and keep up with you even when going faster than physically possible, thanks to Franklin's abilities. The game wanted me to use the spike strips to deal with them, but man, fuck off, I'll do it how I want. It really annoys me how often the game railroads me into completing shit a very specific way, when I literally should have just lost them with how fast I drove away. Whatever. We deliver the fourth car, and as it turns out, Lamar had been watching us and shows up during the end cutscene in which Devin instantly recruits him to find the final car, despite Franklin's warnings. With that done, it's time for Frank to catch up with Michael, or at least try to, since, well, Michael is a little bit preoccupied at the moment. Now living in Trevor's trailer alongside Martin's wife Patricia, Michael is kinda on lockdown, and instead, Trevor is gonna go back to his old antics out in the desert, this time by attacking a Meriwether plane, thanks to info we got from Ron. Now, this is Grand Theft Auto, and there are plenty of times when I'm willing to suspend my disbelief. In this mission, however, we use a freaking crop duster plane to catch up to a massive cargo plane, somehow don't get shot down by automatic missile defense systems, and then crash inside without dying, all of which is, to put it lightly, beyond unbelievable. Why didn't the plane have the ability to shoot down the crop duster? Why would soldiers attempt to shoot it down by opening up the rear cargo bay and shooting at it with manually aimed RPGs? Why and how would Trevor even know they were going to open the rear door, and therefore what the hell was his plan if they didn't? It's all a little, no, quite ridiculous, but I also kind of love it. This mission is also very clearly a mashup slash reference to multiple missions from GTA San Andreas, specifically NOE and Stowaway, since we both have to fly low for most of the mission and infiltrate a moving plane, which we'll have to jump out of at the end. Alright, so after we steal the plane, then the military shows up and shoots us down, so once again, we still aren't getting paid for this mission. Let's review. We haven't been paid for a single mission since the hotel assassination. What the actual fuck? Alright, well, it's time to get started on our next major heist with the Polito score setup. 
Dave and Steve show up and tell us that now they're going to need us to infiltrate some IAA facility to steal a deadly nerve agent that Steve claims the IAA plans to use in a false flag terror attack to increase their funding. So, long story short, we're going to need at least $2 million to buy a special helicopter needed for the job, which means once again we have to plan a major robbery. Michael phones Lester and we agree to move on a bank, which was originally on the table before they'd settled on the jewelry store, a bank way out in Polito Bay. So it's off to the tippy top of the map, practically, where Lester will meet us to survey the score. Like most of the surveying missions, there isn't much to this one, especially since despite the Polito score being a ton of fun, it barely has any options for you to choose from only giving you the ability to choose a gunman, meaning it always goes relatively the same. So we test the cops' response time, and Trevor insists that all of the cops in the area are dirty, hence their eagerness to defend their money. In every playthrough I've ever done, I thought it was confirmed that all of these cops are dirty, as a way to justify what we end up doing later, but I learned something new this time. After you learn the cops show up fast, you have to race Trevor back to his office, and you get to choose to race solo as Trevor, or as Michael, where Lester is with you. I chose Michael this time, and it led to an interesting conversation where Lester implies that he doesn't actually necessarily believe that all of the cops are dirty, and is just going along with what Trevor says. This changed my perspective a little bit of the heist in general, and it's an interesting detail I'd never noticed before. Oh yeah, I chose Packy as my gunman, by the way. Immediately after completing this setup, I get a call from Franklin launching me into the mission Predator. Well, it actually didn't auto-switch me, so I'm not sure how much time I could have spent as Trevor here before it did. Once you do switch to Frank, though, you take control of him as he's driving down the Western Highway chasing after the remaining O'Neill brothers, because apparently he was undertaking the mission of tracking them down. I do think that Trevor asks him to do this at some point, but I can't remember. Anyways. Once we follow them long enough, they crash their car, and we have to switch to Trevor and Michael en route to Frank's location using Trevor's helicopter. Yeah, so Trevor has a helicopter now, ever since the Mission 3's company. He just kind of kept the one that you used in that mission. We fly over to Franklin and have to use a sniper with a thermal scope to locate the O'Neill brothers from the air. You do get some choice here, you can look for the last one at least as Frank or Mike, but I think you have to kill the first couple as Michael. I could have sworn there was a special animation of Chop catching Elwood here, but you just kind of unceremoniously kill him, or I did anyway. Then all of us, including Chop, hop back into the chopper and head back to Trevor's airfield. So playing as Trevor, a bit later I run into these two clowns, and I've got to say, of all the ridiculous shit in this game, it was truly this that made me stop and go, what? Somehow, some way, this guy Joe, who is your stereotypical racist redneck, is working with this other guy Joseph, who we saw in an earlier mission at the Yellow Jack Inn, and is actually married to the bartender there. And the two of them have formed a civilian border patrol to round up immigrants. The truly mind-boggling thing, though, is that Joseph doesn't speak a word of English, but only Russian. Joe acts like he knows what Joseph is saying, but doesn't appear to actually know, and Joseph seems to believe that he's actually speaking English? Like, what the hell is going on here? In addition to the weird premise, this mission started to bring to my attention a problem that I have with a lot of the Strangers and Freaks missions in GTA 5. In GTA 4, there were strangers you could meet who usually were just side characters from missions, but were sometimes completely new characters. They would offer you many missions, sometimes even a couple telling a short story that doesn't necessarily connect to the larger one, but is a fun diversion. In GTA 5, half of the strangers offer you obscure tasks that the protagonists don't even actually seem interested in doing, but are compelled to since you control them. Franklin with the grassroots missions and Beverly, Michael with the submarine lady who I haven't actually spoken to in this playthrough, and now Trevor with these clowns. I don't want to say it breaks my immersion because of how cliche that is, and because GTA 5 isn't usually going for immersion, but... It is really weird, and often makes me not want to play Strangers and Freaks missions beyond the need to complete things the game puts in front of me. So anyway, we chase down a pair of partying mariachis and use the stun gun to subdue them long enough for Joe and Joseph to load them up into their truck and drive off. Well, they tried to drive off, but apparently got lost, so I... Kinda got a little angry. ...and shot up the car, only killing the mariachis as Joseph ran off. Joe appeared to be invulnerable to bullets. He was not, however, invulnerable to explosions. Their next mission will still spawn though, and they won't stay dead until we're given the opportunity to kill them in a mission. Spoilers. I then spent a significant amount of time running from the cops, eventually died, and then spent a considerable amount of time reading an in-game ad for some kind of new agey, spiritualism, self-help shit, and eventually stumbled onto an armored car which I proceeded to rob. Somewhere in all that chaos, Frank also got a call from Amanda, wanting to make sure that Michael isn't dead, but not wanting him to know that she called. And eventually, I wound up in the country talking to a dog that led me to a man who crashed his parachute into a tree. Quite the evening, I'd say. 
Speaking of strangers and freaks missions that are just really weird and that the protagonist doesn't seem to have sufficient motivation to participate in, we have our first mission for Dom, Risk Assessment. There isn't much to say about this one, it's kind of like the triathlons or races against Marianne. We have to parachute out of a helicopter, land on top of Mount Chiliad, and then race down the- Yo! What's with the early squirt, dude? Dial it back! Hey, wait for me! <sighs> and then wait for Dom to land, holy shit. Then race down Mount Chiliad and- <laughs> The entire time Dom is in front, but conveniently in the very last stretch he stops trying and we're able to pass him, which is very good because I did not want to do that again. I ended up going on a long bike ride afterwards that ended in a random encounter near Sandy Shores that I've probably never done. I certainly don't remember having ever done it. This guy is getting robbed by some members of the Lost and you can save him. He says he'll give you some money in his car, but once you get there more bikers show up and you gotta fight off the rest. I didn't actually see how much money he gave me though. I don't think he gave me any. I don't know what happened. So, our one and only setup mission for the Polito score involves acquiring some special military hardware by attacking a convoy. You gotta be careful with this one since the dudes you attack are all military and have pretty powerful weapons, but once we get it, take it back to the liquor store and we're ready to jump right into one of my favorite GTA missions, and probably my favorite heist in the game, the Polito score. This mission is in a lot of ways GTA 5's answer to GTA 4's mission, Three Leaf Clover, which is why it's all the more appropriate that I brought Packy McCreary along for the ride. We drive to Polito Bay all the way from Sandy Shores Airfield and jump right into it, marching right into the bank, guns a-blazing. As far as I could tell, you don't actually have to do anything here. None of the civilians would try to hit a panic button earlier or anything like that. As I mentioned before, this mission pretty much always goes the same way, which is ironic considering how much I've shit on missions like Father Son that railroad you down a specific path. The path the mission puts you on, though, is just so much fun. The cutscenes also seem to reinforce the fact that, yes, these cops are really corrupt, but... What's more interesting is that this mission is heavily inspired by real-world events. On February 28, 1997, two men robbed the Bank of America in North Hollywood armed with heavy weapons and heavy-duty body armor. They shot at cops and civilians as they made their escape for almost an hour before being whittled down by cops who had borrowed stronger guns from a nearby gun store to even the odds. Amazingly, no innocent people were killed in the robbery, although many were injured. This robbery is responsible in part for the militarization of police forces across the U.S. and Canada, and it's just kind of crazy to watch even after all these years. These two were quite close to a Michael or Trevor in terms of what they did, too, having robbed multiple banks and armored cars before their attempt in North Hollywood. In the GTA universe, though, we don't have just good body armor, we have like military-grade power armor, basically, as well as at least one minigun, which the North Hollywood robbers thankfully did not have. This mission is most fun when you play as Trevor throughout, since you are very unlikely to run out of ammo, but you do want to be careful since any damage you take will come out of the money you earn. The original plan was for Franklin to meet us on the coast in a boat, but when the cops make that plan a no-go, he instead steals a bulldozer and drives over to scoop everybody up. Then something ridiculous happens, even considering what we've just done. They drop at least two tanks in the area to take us out, but they are such horrendous shots that they don't actually present any threat whatsoever. Two seconds after the tanks show up, we're already ducking inside a nearby chicken factory, where conveniently there just so happens to be a train coming by, which we can use to escape. Then, finally, we get our first payday in a long while, and it's still not all that great. I mean, it's good. Better pay than most missions in other GTA games, but GTA 5 has a lot of things you can actually spend your money on, unlike most other games, and yet only gives you enough money to spend on anything at the very end of the game. Now, I had deliberately avoided spending any of the money I still had until we'd gotten to the Polito score in anticipation of doing the rest of the assassination missions to get a bunch of cash before the end of the game. I ended up only doing the next two, but I'll explain why after I go through what the actual missions entailed. So the second assassination mission is much like a mission from all the way back in 2002's Vice City, requiring us to drive halfway across the map to find each target and dispatch them as quickly as possible. Making heavy use of Franklin's special ability in these isn't actually essential, but it makes them a whole lot easier. First target is a gym bro lifting weights on the beach, second is out on a boat off the coast and needs to be sniped, third is on a window cleaning platform near Eclipse Towers, and the last one is driving his bike in Vinewood Hills. Our next assassination is really simple. We gotta drive out to La Puerta where our target regularly meets a prostitute. What I always do is park down the street, position myself just outside my vehicle with a sniper, and wait for him. It seems to always be the fourth car, and you might even be able to shoot him as soon as you see him, regardless of whether you've gotten the confirmation by seeing the prostitute get in the car with him. 
Now, while I completed both of these last two assassinations close to each other, I actually spent probably an hour or more loading and reloading saves trying to get the most money from buying and selling stocks on the game's two separate markets, the LCN and the Bossack. This should not be necessary. I mean, it isn't necessary, but like I said, there are a lot of things you could buy in GTA V, and the game won't give you a decent amount of money to spend until the end, so finding ways to make money early would be super helpful. As it turns out though, doing this in such a way that you maximize your profits is a giant pain in the ass. Not to mention that realistically you're supposed to wait until after the last heist to even do these, which I just don't have the patience to do. Anyways, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, just know that the stocks are annoying, and then having to switch between characters to buy and sell is a time-consuming and mind-numbing process. In the end, I got Michael to about 3 million, while Frank and Trevor barely touched 1 million and half a mil, respectively. Shortly after getting frustrated with the assassinations and giving up, I ran into another random encounter out here by the LS Customs near Sandy Shores. Now this was one of the few things that I'd spent Franklin's money on at this point, the LS Customs store, since it allows you to upgrade any vehicles for free as Franklin. I guess Frank doesn't extend his discount to Trevor and Michael, which is amusing, but anyway. After buying it, I ran into the Duke of Death just down the road, and normally the game would try to ambush you with his truck off to the side, but knowing that was coming, I immediately used Frank's ability to run off into the desert. Only for the NPCs to inevitably rubber band me, forcing me to kill them anyway, despite definitely getting enough distance on them to just lose them. Oh, I also finally found all five cars that the Epsilon program wanted, and I definitely did not do it by using my mod menu to spawn the cars because I'm too lazy to spend several hours finding them around the map. That would just be inexcusable. And to top things off, I spent a bunch of the money that I'd earned from the Polito score and assassination investments to finish buying and upgrading pretty much all of the weapons for Michael and Trevor, and most for Franklin. I find it really cool, but also frustrating that a bunch of the weapons that have been released for GTA Online since 2013 are purchasable at Ammunition, but like, if you'll give us the guns in single player, why not the vehicles too? There are by this point hundreds of vehicles exclusive to Online, and it's a real shame because GTA Online isn't for everybody. In fact, it might not be for anybody. Well, it's time to get back to missions and get back to Los Santos with another one of my favorites, Derailed. So apparently, there is a regular monthly train that runs through Blaine County that Trevor and Ron have been keeping tabs on for some time, and it's about to make its pass through Ratted Canyon any minute now. So the play is for Michael to jump into a boat and head up the river while Trevor hijacks the train and crashes it at the bridge over the river, where Mike will be able to break in and steal whatever Merriweather has on board. Oh yeah, apparently the train is owned or protected by Merriweather. You gotta ride a Sanchez alongside the train, a la wrong side of the tracks, and then leap on top using the elevated path, and then drive to the front to steal it. I actually landed on the train on my first try here, which never happens for me. You're given like four different chances to make the jump, and I know for a fact I have definitely missed all four before. When you actually drive on top, you get to see that this train is really long too, closer to the length a freight train would have in real life than any other train you'll see during normal gameplay or online. You're technically given control of the train, but it hardly matters as you only drive it for like a minute before you switch to Michael. Now eventually, Trevor crashes the train into an oncoming one on the bridge, but as far as I remember, there were no double tracks or switches leading up to this point. And it's not like Trevor sped the train up all that significantly, so like, wouldn't this have happened anyway? Then, the Merryweather fleet's here, bro, and we get our first chance to use and abuse the minigun that I bought by making short work of everything trying to kill us, except for the snipers, which we have to manually take out one by one. Once Michael finds something of value inside the train, it's back into the boat for a final section of escaping down the river, where we can choose to either shoot as Trevor or drive as Mike. When we finally land on the coast, Mike and Trevor sort of kinda make up for the tension that has existed since Trevor kidnapped Patricia. Trevor agrees to give up any payment for the job by giving away the statue they found to Madrazzo, as well as returning his wife, but only if Michael agrees to try and pull off the big one, robbing the Union Depository. After derailed, we are essentially launched right into our next mission, Monkey Business, which is the raid that Steve Haynes had us rob a bank in order to finance. Well, Steve was apparently supposed to tell us to bring a full six-man crew, but when poor communication leads to us being three men short, Steve and Dave have no choice but to personally accompany us into Humane Labs to get our hands on the neurotoxin that the IAA has apparently been manufacturing. Trevor and Frank head out to secure our getaway, and then we're off as Michael, along with Steve and Dave, to infiltrate the facility via an underwater drainage pipe. We have to actually manually open the grate in a stupid minigame, and once again I am sat here wondering why this was part of the game at all. Resources were spent on animating this, creating the textures, writing the dialogue, when we could have just as easily had Dave do it before we reached the grate, or just entered the facility a different way. GTA 5 has an absurd amount of pointless minigames that are especially egregious in their use online, but this one is particularly tedious and annoying. 
Once we're finally through, we swim through the intake pipe for an obnoxious amount of time, and then once we surface, we're given access to a stun gun to subdue each employee as we make our way through the lab. I think you can just go loud here from the start if you want to, but whatever you choose to do, it doesn't really get difficult until the very end, after you grab the neurotoxin. After that, you have to actively fight your way outside until you're switched to Trevor to swoop in and grab this stuff. The window for escape is way too narrow though, so Steve ends up staying behind and shooting himself in the leg to try and pose as a double agent, while the rest of us escape to Trevor's airfield, encountering zero resistance on the way back, which once again, makes me wonder why this section is even here. Why didn't Franklin come with and Trevor had some choppers pursue him on the way back or something? I don't know. As monkey business wraps up, Michael learns that Lester has successfully sold the statue they stole and derailed and transferred the funds to Madrazzo. Trevor is also on his way to bring Patricia back as we speak, which means Michael is finally free to go back to the city, since returning to Los Santos at any point prior to this but after Kaida Libre will result in Madrazzo's hitman trying to hunt you down. We switch to Trevor, where If You Leave Me Now is playing, to this very amusing but very disturbing scene if you think about it for any length of time, where we get to see a little bit of whatever Trevor did to Martin in order to get Patricia in the first place. Before Michael heads back into civilization proper though, he's got a cult to continue trying to join. With all five vehicles delivered to the Epsilonists, we're given our next mission for them in Chasing the Truth all the way out in Grapeseed. Now, I would have much preferred it if most of the Epsilon missions were more like the last one than whatever this is. Last time we had to find them a bunch of cars because, you know, it's Grand Theft Auto. Now though, we have to spend like minutes, very, very slowly, walking from one point to another using this stupid divination thing, all to make another joke about Scientology. And while I am all for making fun of Scientologists and Tom Cruise, I am not for wasting my time. Then again, I did choose to do these voluntarily, so maybe I actually am. Eventually, it was time for Trevor to head back to Floyd's apartment in Vespucci for our next mission, which is another one that doesn't really count as a mission, and is really just an interactive cutscene, albeit a very amusing one. You ain't my G-damn cousin, Trevor. I thought we was family. But please, just go and ruin somebody else's home furnishings. Who the F is that, Floyd? No one, my sweet. Hey, by any chance, did you catch crabs at that conference? <laughs> I heard that those conferences are regular little fuck fest, huh? Guy, come in. Huh? I'd like you to leave mm. right now. Oh yeah, some serious corporate gang banging going on, right? Yeah, with every executive and director of communications from here to Bangalore taking it left, right, and center in the name of team training, right? I mean, now that's what Floyd told me yesterday as he was staring at my uh, my penis. I want you to leave. Look, this is all I've got, all right? I had a tough upbringing. My daddy was not nice to me, okay? And look, Deborah, I love you, and I love you too, Floyd. Why can't we all just be together, huh? You can have Mondays through Thursdays. You can have the weekends, all right? I know that's not normal, but in this crazy, crazy world, is normal so good, huh? Look, Deborah, Floyd, will you marry me? Get out of my condo! And you go too, Floyd! I told you, I've got a career! I don't need this, this, this crap! Yes! There. <laughs> you made me swear. You're crap, Floyd. Crap! <laughs> You're not a man at all. <laughs> Bob's right about you. Oh, who's Bob? I want both of you to go now, you and your weird friend. Whoa! Hey! My name is Trevor, sweetheart. I could give a fuck what your fucking name is! I'm not afraid to use this. I'm not. Bob taught me. Fuck Bob! You people are not very fucking nice! Trevor? <laughs> oh. mm, hey there, Wade. Did you meet Deborah? Ooh, interesting lady. I should probably go say hi. I wouldn't. Why not? Let's go get in the car, all right? Let's go have the time of our lives. Now I guess some people watch that scene and somehow their takeaway is that Trevor doesn't kill both Floyd and Deborah, 
but I honestly have no idea how to interpret this any other way, and I am 99% sure that is exactly what the developers intended. Anyway, once Floyd and Deborah are out of the picture, Trevor needs a new safe house in Los Santos, so we bring Wade with us over to a strip club in Strawberry and introduce the manager to a little concept called Hostile Takeover, but with a Trevor twist. Amigo! Prepare to meet your new partner. It's time to take the next step in reuniting with our holy father Kraft, Kiflam, by speaking to Marnie in this alley where she tells us to purchase the special Epsilon robes and wear them for 10 days straight. Well, I guess I'm doing this now. Well, cult or no cult, it is finally time to start planning the big one, the Union Depository. Like all of the previous missions surveying a score, this is pretty standard. We do, however, have to drive and fly halfway across the map in this one to scope out the entrance of the building, grab a helicopter, watch the route of the security vans, and scope out the excavation conveniently right next to the vault because building plan are dumb, I guess. But now it's time to sit back, relax, and... Uh-oh. Hey, man. I've got a bad feeling about this. Fuck. So this is one of the most important missions in the game, and perhaps one of its best. Right up there with Hood Safari. In fact, the missions in the game's third act are all very good, and among the best the game has to offer. This is much appreciated, but it would have been cooler if we got some of the elements we'll see in more abundance earlier in the game. Trevor finally confronts Michael about Brad, the guy killed in the game's introduction who was buried in Michael's place. This whole time, Trevor believed, or wanted to believe, that Brad was still alive, and Dave Norton had been emailing Trevor pretending to be Brad to keep up the illusion, since both he and Michael stood to lose if Trevor found out. Well, now he knows, or at least, he's finally stopped lying to himself, and runs off to fly all the way up to North Yankton, dig up the grave marked Michael Townley, and see who's really down there. This whole bit is just excellent, so I'm going to show you guys a clip from my episode of GTA Biographies on Michael, and come back at you when the action starts. Listen, Amanda, we're going to move to Los Santos, start over. I made a deal. The slate will be totally wiped clean. Hey, everybody pays attention, no one gets hurt. Trust me, darling, look at me. Amanda, it was the only thing I could do. Either everyone dies or one guy gets out. I'm that guy. Slow and steady, team. Slow and steady. His name is Dave Norton, nice guy, realist. He gets the glory, I get out. It's not even a decision. Amanda, I don't have a choice. Do you want to die here where it's always snowing? Or do you want to go and live where it's always sunny? All right, you want to live? Tell me you want to live. Work this out. Some depot out of town, you don't need to know. Trust me, nothing is going to go wrong. Nothing. Yeah, I hear you. We got to follow the plan. Everything will work out. I did the deal, Amanda. It's over. Baby, we get out. Be happy. Be normal. It ain't supposed to go down like this. We did it. Baby, we are home free. It's over. This is fucked, man. The thing is blown. Just this one job and everything is done. Everything is done. Everything is done. Hey, you're wasting your time. Is that why you flew out here? Huh? Tell me I'm wasting my time? Go ahead, dig it up. I don't give a shit. Yeah, that's what you look like. The guy who doesn't give a shit. That's ridiculous. How long are you gonna keep lying for, Mikey, huh? When's it gonna stop? What happens in the dark? It comes out in the light. I'll give it a rest, Trevor. There's nothing there. Uh, this is it. Moment of truth. As if I didn't know. Brad! Look, we do what we gotta do to survive. This thing, it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. Oh, and how was that, huh? 
With Brad in the can and me in the ground, or, 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 or both of us in the coffin. Brad got shot. You saw it. He didn't make it. I got shot, I did. That's, that's it. I think the only thing that didn't go as planned was me showing up on your doorstep 10 years later. Mikey, I mourned you. And I missed you. But I got a fucking family, Trevor. We were all gonna die. He did die. You reptilian motherfucker! I didn't want it to come to this. Yes, you did! You just don't have the fucking balls to do it! But I do! I got more to lose than you! Never a truer word has been spoken, brother! Now pull the fucking trigger! You ain't got the guts. Take the fucking shot! Who is that? Fuck! Fuck! Ah! Fuck! Joe Phillips! Mr. Cho has requested a word! Hey, ho, ho! I'm not the guy you're looking for! Hey, how's it been? How's it been? Get the boyfriend! Boyfriend? Motherfucker. So once Trevor runs off, we're given control of Michael and have to fight our way through dozens of triads in a graveyard with only a pistol in the middle of the night. This is a great fight. Short and sweet, but the limited arsenal means you have to play smart, unless you've used Michael's special ability enough to just sail through this section relying on bullet time completely. Eventually we reach Michael's car, but Trevor takes the keys and the triads catch Michael, taking him back with them to Los Santos, while we're given control of Trevor as he makes his own return journey by plane. Oh right, so I didn't properly explain why the triads were actually there. See, Wei Cheng has been periodically trying to get his hands on Trevor ever since he destroyed the O'Neill's farm, but kept missing him while Trevor was off pulling heists or otherwise being his crazy self. Wei Cheng is the father of that crazy guy from way back in Trevor's introduction. After observing Trevor, Michael, and Patricia living together in his trailer, Wei Cheng assumes that T and M are lovers and conspires to kidnap Michael in order to try and force Trevor to stop moving meth in Blaine County. Obviously not having followed the story quite correctly, Wei Cheng is thus left with his dick in his hand since Trevor no longer has any interest in saving him, and therefore Wei Cheng has no leverage. What this means for Michael is that he is no longer useful, and we all know what that means for people in this line of work. But before we get to that, we got some cars to deliver. Time to get paid. Alright, so rapid fire, another big mission with the conclusion to the Devon Weston cars heist. Since Lamar was put in charge of locating the final car, we know that we're ready to go when Frank gets a message from LD saying that he's got the fifth car. We meet him and Lamar says that he had no issue at all stealing the ride, which Franklin finds suspicious, but we have no time to worry about that, it's already a four hour ride up to Polito Bay from Los Santos. In game, anyway. So the first part of the mission is just a long drive, with a whole lot of lore dump as Franklin falls asleep, and we get the one and only conversation between Lamar and Trevor. We get to learn a lot about how Michael and Trevor's relationship originally got started, but before we can get all the details, the cops finally reveal themselves, having tailed us all the way from the city. Well, one of the cars on the truck happens to be a James Bond type car, which Devin modified to have real machine guns, and spike traps, which I neglected to use when retrieving the car. So we have to keep the truck moving as the cops swarm us, while Frank climbs on the top to get inside the JB700, at which point we switch to him and have to use the car to get rid of all the cops chasing us. Like in the mission Blitz play, and unlike any other normal time in gameplay, we can just kill all the cops and then instantly lose our wanted level here as we arrive at the drop-off point, Procopio Truck Stop, where the other shoe finally drops. In light of the drama your efforts caused, we felt it was not perhaps the best idea for you two to be seen together for a while. Where's the money? Mr. Weston is one of the most brilliant investors the world has ever known. He's obviously a maverick, but he's also rigorous in his research. Yeah, he may be brilliant. Look, let me be the first to tell you. He ain't gonna fall in love with your ass. Now, where the fuck is my money? The best thing that could have happened to you in this situation has happened. He is going to hold your money, invest it in his alpha fund, and make the funds available to you at a time as the transfer will not induce any undue attention. Which is a polite way of saying I'm getting robbed? Are you fucking kidding me? That is a short-sighted and frankly immature way of seeing things, Mr. Clinton. Let's go. I boost cars and pop motherfuckers. Maturity is not really my fucking thing. So yeah, all that work for absolutely nothing. Not that that's new for the game. On the way back to the city, Franklin talks to Lester about Devin screwing him over and it eventually leads to talk of Michael. When Lester realizes that Michael flew up to North Yankton and that his cell phone hasn't been used since, he and Franklin suspect the worst and devise a plan to locate him and see if he's alright. He's, uh, he's not alright. 
Then we get one of the game's funniest cutscenes, which many people already know was heavily ad-libbed by Steven Ogg and Sean Fenteno, and it's pretty great. Oh, what a, is that how you act, huh? When a, when a friend makes a mistake, huh? No. Really? Man. Oh, no. What, oh, so what, it's just me getting hurt? Is that funny? No, huh? man. Well, fuck you! I'm gonna put you in the fucking ground, you laugh at me again! Man, calm down. I have met a lot of assholes in my life, but you... Oh, you're not long for this world if this is the way you fucking act, you little jumped up motherfucker! Look, how about this, man? Calm down. It was funny at first, man. I made a mistake. Unfortunately, man, you failed. It was funny, alright? I, I apologize. I accept your apology, okay? All right, so let's hug it out. Mm -hmm. ah, ah, right? You're so fucking you funny, gotcha. No. Oh, fuck, no, I'm not funny. Fucking asshole. Oh, fuck, I, I had a difficult childhood. Damn, man, you all right? Just, I'm just fucking on edge, you know? Look, I love you, right? But I would have... I would have... Look, fucking! Look, man. Lester said you had some information for us about Michael. Michael? Fuck Michael! I hope he's dead. Man, I know y'all two, man. Come on, man. You two had beef before. But what the fuck happened in North Yankton? Somebody pinched him, man. Who? My friend Ron met these Chinese assholes. They're from Yangshan in China. We had some problems. They mistakenly thought Michael was a human being and kidnapped him. Yeah, and now it looks like they holding him somewhere in the city. Yes. Come on, bro. Well, go fuck yourself. You want that piece of shit? That's your fucking business, all right? He's dead to me, all right? And chances are, if and when I see him, he's gonna be dead to everyone else as well. Hey, come on, bro. Don't do that. You're pushing your luck, pal. What was that? What? What was that? Uh, nothing. Ah! Mm, asshole! Everybody! Assholes! Franklin learns that Trevor and Mike had a falling out, and that now Mike has been kidnapped by the Wei Chang Triad, and is likely already dead or will be very soon. So using an app on our phone given to us by Lester, we track down Michael to a slaughterhouse on the east side of town and have to fight our way through the building as triads fall into meat processing machines left and right. This is another good mission. When we finally reach Michael, we free him and then continue fighting our way outside until we can hop into a car and make a run for it. As we drop Michael off, we get a cutscene where Franklin finally confronts Michael about his dishonesty. As Frank rightly puts it, Mike burned just about everybody he ever knew. Depending on the ending you choose, because spoilers, there are three, this scene can end up becoming one of the most important in the game, and even if you do choose ending C, this scene does still carry a lot of weight. Especially this line. Look, you wake up one day, and, and your legs, they just give. You just can't run anymore. But there's no time to rest, because yet again, the FIB needs our help to clean up their mistakes. More specifically, Steve Haynes. In case you missed the news report, after the raid on Humane Labs to secure the neurotoxin, it was discovered that it was actually just hairspray formula. More importantly though, much like Tenpenny and GTA San Andreas, all of Steve's less than legal methods for getting results have finally started to catch up to him, as people within the agency and even the bureau now suspect that he was responsible for the raid. So, Steve and Dave want Michael to plan an infiltration of the FIB headquarters in order to destroy all of the evidence they have on Steve, and in the process, Michael, Franklin, and presumably Trevor too. Now, this is our usual surveillance mission where we scope out the job, but it is among the most boring. Nope, scratch that. It is the most boring. You have to tail a security guard who helps you get inside if you take the subtle route, and when you're sitting and waiting for his car, you literally sit there for like five minutes. It's kind of ridiculous. Once he finally does come out, you tail him back to his apartment, which is always fun, follow him inside, and then convince him to let us use his ID and uniform in the space of like 30 seconds, no questions asked. We are given our only setup for the Bureau Raid, which with this method is just getting the blueprints, which is more of a traditional mission than a typical heist setup. Before we do that though, we head down to the movie studio as Michael to find Rocco Pelosi beating the crap out of Solomon in the parking lot of his own studio. Remember how I said we didn't actually get to kill Rocco on the last mission? 
Well, now we finally do. After all of his annoying BS in Ballad of Gay Tony and his brief appearance in this game, we finally get the opportunity to put him down. But it doesn't have a unique cutscene or anything. This entire mission is just chase and kill Rocco, so depending on how quickly you catch up to him, this can be a long chase, or as it was for me, it can be over in like two minutes. Boom. And immediately afterwards, we are launched into that setup I mentioned, with Franklin tailing the architect of the FIB building to his current project, the Mile High Club, which still, canonically, isn't finished construction ten years later. And it might be my fault. Every time I've ever done this mission in the past, it's been the way the game expects. Follow the guy up to the tower, knock him out, take the case, and escape with no trouble. This time, though, I accidentally pulled out a grenade while tailing him. I didn't even throw it, but somebody saw me and everybody started panicking, including the architect who started running away. And that's when I learned you can just... kill him. Huh. Well, shit. Lose the cops and then return the plants to Lester's Garment Factory and we are already good to go for the penultimate heist in the game and the second one Trevor isn't included in, the Bureau Raid. Well, not quite yet. We got a couple more missions that we can do before the heist if we want to, and I did want to. The first mission's title is a reference to an important mission in GTA San Andreas, but the actual gameplay of the mission is pretty limited, being another story-heavy one where the gameplay elements are kinda tacked on. So Jimmy finally comes home, finding Michael lounging on the sofa as usual, and after a brief and pretty terrible apology, he convinces Michael that to get Amanda back, he has to show that he's willing to fight for her. So it's off to show Fabian why everybody hates the French. Oh, and it's okay for me to say that, I'm French. We get to see Fabian showing his true colors, which eventually leads to Michael smacking him upside the head with his poor innocent woman's laptop. Followed up by a kick to the head from Jimmy, and after an apology from Michael, Amanda finally agrees to at least try moving back in. We still gotta get Tracy though, who is down at the tattoo parlor trying to get herself another shot at fame after he ruined her last one. So then we tattoo a dick on Laszlo's chest, or back, but I mean, come on. Give him some pretty terrible piercings and chop his ponytail off, very classy. Finishing off with some good old fashioned blackmail and threats. And now everybody's happy, except Laszlo. So now that the family is all together, it's time to meet Amanda at Dr. Freelander's office for a family therapy session which I'm sure will be very productive and- I should have had you locked up years ago, you stupid Do shit! It. Do it! I'll put you in the fucking ground with the rest of them. And that's really all the time we have. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> Awkward. Yeah, so after this, everything is apparently good because all of that was just catharsis for them, but I mean, if you routed me out to the police for all my various crimes, I would murder you is pretty intense, especially to say to, you know, your wife and the mother of your children. Not exactly sure how Amanda's cool with just writing that one off, but yeah, alrighty then. So Michael has his family back now. Hooray, I suppose. Last one before the Bureau Raid is another important story mission that has some pretty epic set pieces that Rockstar themselves were very fond of using when demonstrating the game's graphical capabilities, both back then and with the release of the expanded and enhanced versions last year or whenever the hell that was. So the movie we've been working on for Solomon as Michael, Meltdown, is going to be cancelled in order to trigger a massive insurance payout to the studio owner and our good buddy, Mr. Devin Weston. So when Molly leaves to take the only physical copy out of the state, Mike chases after her all the way to Los Santos International. When she realizes Michael is chasing her though, well, she panics a bit. We finally catch up to her and once again, I wish the game wouldn't put us into situations where we should be able to kill somebody and can't, but well... She has a scripted death, and to be fair, it's pretty gnarly. Way gnarlier than whatever we could have done. Look out! Oh, that didn't have to happen! So, grab the film, lose the cops, and... You believe that analog thing? It's all digital. We have backups everywhere. I mean, we're shooting on green screen. Oh, god damn it. Well, I'm sure Devin won't be too upset. At least the movie premiere is back on. On our way to finally do the Bureau Raid though, we get interrupted by one of only a few missions that can be triggered at certain points in the story by phone calls. The first one was when we had to save Amanda when she got arrested for stealing, and this one requires us to meet Tracy and deal with a stalker of hers, now that she's getting famous again. Well, much like another story mission we'll have to do for Jimmy later, Tracy would much prefer it if we just scare her stalker rather than outright kill him, so that's what I do. With him dealt with though, we finally are ready to go take on our next heist in the Bureau Raid, so let's get to it. So as you may recall, we chose the roof method rather than the fire truck one, which means that we have to drive all the way to this facility to meet the pilot, who will fly us above the building where we will parachute down. Oh, actually, Michael, for some godforsaken reason, is going to fly us up, and then the pilot will take control of the bird as we jump. Motherfucker, are we paying you? Because we better not be. This mission is very action movie. Leap from the sky, cut a hole in the glass ceiling because fuck the patriarchy, and bam, it's time to rob the fucking FBI. I mean, FIB. Just like the pilot, why the hell did we need a hacker? Because Michael ends up having to do that too. 
and then we gotta hold out against the waves of baddies while all the files we need transfer, I guess. Once the files are finally done, we start pushing our way down through the building when our useless ass pilot fails to extract us. Good riddance. This is also because, in order to save resources, both of the methods for entry, despite being completely different, result in the identical destruction of the building, which we then have to make our way through in the dark. This is an instance where having flashlights on your guns is really good, because it makes dealing with the numerous FIB dudes trying to swarm you in the dark a lot easier. Eventually, we reach a spot where we can rappel down the side of the building like in the Mission 3's company, only this time we gotta do it with half of the LSPD trying to murder us. After we clear all the cops on the ground, our driver secures us a clean escape by having an ambulance parked out front, so we hop in and glide away from the scene, pretending to be just another first responder. Now, to make up for Michael making a lot more money than either Trevor or Franklin up to this point, this heist pays Michael nothing while Franklin and the rest of the crew get a cut. And I could have sworn this heist paid nothing at all, so that was nice. Soon it won't matter much though, since what we make from this heist is nothing compared to what we'll be getting in the final heist, which is the next one. Well, we are officially in the game's final stretch now, and the good missions will just keep on coming. As we wrap up the Bureau raid, Dave sets up one final meet to square things away, or so he says, with the mission The Wrap-Up. How appropriate. So we drive on up to the court center to meet Dave and learn that he and Steve do not intend to honor their agreement, and let Michael go after the Bureau raid. No, instead, Steve is going to try and have us all arrested in a Mexican standoff, and then himself learn that one of his own men had been a plant for the agency the entire time, Agent Sanchez. And then fucking Agent ULP from GTA 4 shows up and all hell breaks loose. We actually get the chance to kill ULP here, which I do, but he's another character who canonically survives because he's seen again in a DLC for GTA Online years later. So we're thrown into one of the most intense gunfights we've yet seen with FIB agents, agency goons, and Meriwether all trying to kill us and each other. In the chaos, Trevor makes his return, saving Michael at the last minute because if anybody's gonna kill him... Hey! If anyone's gonna kill you, old friend! It's gonna be me! And then we can choose to clear the courtyard either as Trevor up on his sniper perch or as Michael on the ground, in the thick of it. Trevor finally acknowledges that Dave is the one that killed Brad, but chooses to save him on Michael's behalf, I guess, but I end up encountering a problem I did not anticipate at the end here. All three of us go our separate ways, but Trevor tells Mike they need to meet up so they can talk, but before we can do that, we have to leave the court center with a Meriwether chopper on our ass. Well, I decided to be proactive and try to shoot it down, but god damn. This particular chopper is really aggressive. He ended up killing me several times before I finally learned to hang all the way back to get a good shot. Afterwards, we meet up with Trevor and learn the reason that he decided to save Mike, the big one. Trevor is willing to set aside his differences and move on, if and only if Michael is willing to pull the big score. So we phone Lester and let him know that it's back on, and now all we gotta do is decide how we're gonna do it, and do the setups. Except, hold up, actually we got two more missions before we can get to the setups, both of which will themselves set up the finale, or at least one of them, the canon ending. Lamar Down sees the return of Tanisha, who is only mentioned in conversation beyond this one cutscene early in the game that can be triggered when switching to Franklin. She tells us that somehow, some way, she learned that Lamar had been brought up to a sawmill near Polito Bay, where Stretch is going to have him killed. So, let's not even get into why the hell Stretch hasn't killed him already, and instead focus on the fact that Stretch isn't even in this mission which he really should have been. Him being in this mission would have gone a long way in making his role in the finale a lot more meaningful since he hasn't been seen since Hood Safari. And like, how the hell does Tanisha know all of this when she has presumably not been spending much time in the Hood herself with her new boyfriend being a rich dentist or brain surgeon or something? Whatever, long story short, Frank calls Lester who helps to figure out exactly where Lamar is and Lester in turn calls both Michael and Trevor for backup, who meet us up by the sawmill which is all the way across the damn map. Michael and Trevor bicker like children, and we get everybody into position, and then we get some choice in how exactly we go about assaulting the building. I end up taking this bulldozer since the game encourages me to, and I'd never done it before, but like, I'm not really sure what I expected. It didn't help much. And again, during all of this, why did the Ballas not just shoot Lamar, who was being held captive? Like, obviously the reason is because game, but damn, stuff like this always takes me out of it just a little bit. Eventually, we locate Lamar, put down the rest of the Balas, and then we gotta drive his ass all the way back to Los Santos, but at least this time we get a nice long conversation between Frank and LD. Even though we saved him, Lamar ends up being less than grateful, which isn't helped by Franklin's holier-than-thou attitude, and it ends with the two of them parting ways on less than ideal terms. As Franklin goes to walk away, though, he is confronted by Steve Haynes and Dave Norton, who have decided what they need to do to keep themselves above ground. 
and Franklin is going to help him do it. Hey, when the timing's right, you're gonna take old Trevor and put him out to pasture, oh me. See, Michael will be sensible, but Trevor, Trevor won't be. Trevor is a liability that none of us can afford. Man, Trevor saved you. He saved both y'all asses. And it's unfortunate. Hey, when we give you the word, you're gonna do this thing. Man, get Michael to do it. Me and Trevor cool, dawg. Michael can't do it. Trevor won't let him near. That's why it's up to you, homie. Oh, fuck. Hey, who is that? Nobody. Don't worry about it, nigga. Hey. Oh, flossing ass nigga. And so the first scenario is laid out for us. And now to finish setting up another antagonist with the mission Meltdown. We first gotta change into a tuxedo at Ponsonbiz, or however you say the name, and then Jimmy meets us outside in a limo so we can ride to the movie premiere in style. At the premiere though, a not so welcome guest shows up to show his support, Devin Weston, and drops the hint that Michael's family is about to be executed by Meriwether if he doesn't get to them in the next two minutes. So we hop into a much faster car than the limo we took here, and race back to Michael's house, where Meriwether are holding Amanda and Tracy hostage, sort of. We burst in and take down a guy that Amanda's grappling with, and then have to take out another using Tracy as a human shield. Then once the family is safe, we have to clear out the rest of the house, inside and out. Wait, where did Jimmy go? Ah, I'm sure he's fine. Alright, I think we got them all. Ah, I got you, dick! Oh, uh, oh, be all right. No, it's not. Oh, oh, what was that? Someone there? I'm gonna start shooting! Oh, fuck! fuck. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you like that, don't you, huh? Take it off! Oh, oh. Get oh. the fuck off me! I, I thought I was on that guy! Oh. So you sit on his face? It's called teabagging? I really fucked him up good, though, huh? Alright, listen, I'm gonna make a call. It's all gonna be okay. Stay put. So we just narrowly managed to save our family, but now the gloves are off, and Michael is capital P pissed. He tells Amanda and the kids to stay at a hotel while he sorts things out, but there's one last thing we have to do before it's time to come back on Weston and our numerous other enemies. It's finally time. The big one. So this mission is literally just choosing our method of attack, so I go with the obvious route, because it's a lot more fun overall in my opinion, and it also means we get to steal a train. The one thing that sucks though is that there are five crew members needed for this and I've only ranked up three, Packy, Ricky, and Kareem, which means I end up having to use some newbies for this one. I went with Chef since he's competent despite working for Trevor, and Eddie Toe since he's the best driver, but we don't need a hacker in this one so poor Ricky doesn't get to join us. What's funnier is that even after this heist, the game will tell us that their skills increase even though this is the last heist, which makes me wonder if that was due to their original plans for story DLC. Who knows? Real quick, before we rob the biggest bank on the west coast, we gotta save Jimmy from a kidnapper that had enough of his obnoxious trolling. But then, finally, after that, we're ready to go. Well, ready to tackle these setups anyway. So the first thing we need is a giant drill machine to bore a massive hole into the wall opposite the vault, and Lester manages to locate one in a lot on the east side. I head in as Franklin, and I know you can do this setup completely clean by taking out all the guards and workers, but I don't think I've ever managed to do this one without getting the cops. I'm just not a stealthy kind of guy. Thankfully though, I'm Franklin, which means I can use his special ability to escape the cops relatively easily. Which is good, because sometimes losing the cops in a truck like this can be one of the most frustrating things the game asks you to do. Especially since you can't use the tried and true method of the tunnel from the jewelry store heist. Next, we need a train and a single flatbed car, and since, you know, stealing trains is a bit trickier than stealing cars, this is going to require some additional hardware. What's weird though, is that in order to steal the train cars, we need a sky crane like in the mission in Balladigate Tony. But unlike when we had to raid the Humane Labs, we apparently did not need to buy or pay for this extremely niche aircraft, which almost certainly would have cost more than the one we bought for that mission. And that one was like 2 million bucks. But you know, who doesn't have a Sky Crane just lying around, am I right? So we stop a train by switching it off into a siding, and then swoop in with a helicopter to collect the locomotive and a single car. Now all we gotta do is choose a getaway car, so I switched back to Franklin, found an SUV, and took it up to the LS Customs that I own in Blaine County so I could fully upgrade it for free and then returned it to the designated spot underneath the Arcadia Center. And with that, we are finally, actually ready. Let's go do this. This is it. The big one. Now I didn't do both methods by making a save beforehand, so I'm going with the obvious approach and that's final, but if you want to see me break down all the different routes for each heist, you can check out my video on that in the description down below. So we start off by driving to the bank as Michael, where we get my first major complaint about the heist. You don't actually get to see anything that goes on inside the bank as Michael, which is a damn shame. 
Apparently, there is reason to believe that the interior we got for the Pacific Standard Bank and online was originally meant to be for the UD, but I don't actually know if that's true. It does, however, make a whole lot of sense. I bet a lot of the shit that we got in online was probably stuff that was either unfinished from the main game or that was repurposed for online when it originally was meant for the story DLCs. Anyway, we switch over to Franklin using the drill down in the tunnels and we have to hold off the SWAT teams as Packy moves the gold into position to be airlifted out of there. Oh yeah, I guess it didn't explain what the actual plan is here. So Michael is acting as a distraction, going in the front doors to put on a big show in order to keep their attention elsewhere while we nab the gold. Well, it obviously didn't quite go to plan, since a whole hell of a lot of SWAT guys seem well aware of us down here. But eventually, we take care of them and hook up the gold for extraction, and then briefly switch to Trevor to start flying it out of the city, before going back to Michael and Franklin, now together, as they make their escape from the cops. This is easily the most intense gunfight the game has thrown at us thus far, which is appropriate, so the whole move and clear method really becomes essential as you work your way from checkpoint to checkpoint. I ended up dying as Michael, which really sucks, because pulling off a heist without dying is really satisfying, but the more I think about it, the more I am slightly annoyed at the frequency of checkpoints and missions, taking away a lot of the risk we had in previous games. But then I think about all the time that I don't have to spend buying all my weapons back, losing a bunch of money, and then driving back to the start of the mission, and I'm not really sure what the happy medium here would be. Maybe having a difficulty setting where the more hardcore old school players could get the old rules, and another setting where things work the way they do now, but I'm not sure, what do you think? Eventually, we reach the getaway and then have to lose a full 5 star wanted level to cap things off. I do gotta say that I was super disappointed when GTA 4 took away the military at full wanted level, but I was also really saddened by the loss of the 6th star in this game, even if the military hasn't been a thing since like Vice City Stories. Losing the cops here is easy though, since like I said, there is a tried and true method that the game already introduced to us, the tunnel from the very first heist. Head through here and take things at a leisurely pace, and by the time we reach the other side of the tunnel the cops are gone, and now all we gotta do is drop off the gold. We switch to Trevor to move the gold to the train out in the country, but on the way Lester goes a little bit nuts when he gets his hands on a rocket launcher. Fuck on that Merryweather! John Percival! Devin Weston! All the rest of you Illuminati sons of bitches! Suck on my fatty! <laughs> You're unstable, man, you know that? Don't go near the rockets again! Blow me! I noticed while flying that the AI pilot flies right through the windmills, knocking the gold about like crazy, but... Luckily, he has invincibility, since failing the mission because of him would be serious bullshit. But eventually, we take out the rest of the Merryweather Choppers, drop the gold, and we're all done. We fucking did it, baby. Hell yeah. But as Franklin gets home, ready to celebrate after pulling off one of the biggest heists in US history, a ring of the doorbell reminds us that we aren't quite done. Not yet. Hey, Slick, it's me! <laughs> what the fuck do you want? You got my money, punk? Hey. You got some coconut water or something like that? I need some electrolytes. Damn, it's kind of warm, isn't it? Man, you got a death wish or something. Am I supposed to kill you now? Oh, no, bro. Not me. Nah. Oh, yeah. But that's my boy. Yeah, but that's my boy. He has betrayed everyone he's ever known. He's got you involved with the federal government, and he's messed up several business ventures of mine. He has got to go. And you know what? I'd like to say that this isn't personal, but it is personal. But the feds, man. The feds have told me to kill Trevor, and I obviously can't kill them both. The feds. Steve Haynes, Dave Norton. I own shopping malls. I would not employ those two clowns in. And I make one phone call, their careers, they are over. So you're going to A, listen to some 50 grand a year pension hunter, or B, a billionaire, who even the president lets finger his wife, or C, try and be really stupid and save those two idiot mentors of yours and have everybody in the goddamn state crawling up your ass. A, B, or C, time's ticking, pal. Beep, 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 and your answer is... Man, you know what? Man, fuck you. Genius answer, pal. Total genius, but time is running. You think about it. Me, I got a triathlon coming up, and I am in deep training. Bye bye Man, fuck you. So unlike the big score, I did do all three endings here, and did endings A and B for the first time in a very long time. So let's start with killing Michael, which I feel like is the more logical decision if he has to kill one, honestly. And I'll explain. So, in the context of the game, Trevor might be a cannibal, probably a racist, and a man who doesn't really respect physical boundaries, but remember that he is basically a cartoon character because he's meant to represent, in a way, what a person would have to be like to behave the way a lot of GTA players do in-game. So, imagine for a second that these were real people. 
It's likely that the likes of Michael and Franklin would have long ago come to the same conclusion, that Trevor would either get them all killed or kill them himself because of how unhinged and unpredictable he is. But again, in the context of the game, there isn't really any fear on Franklin's part that Trevor is just going to turn on him or that he's unpredictable in that kind of way at all. Franklin, like Trevor and Michael, will also occasionally run over an innocent pedestrian in broad daylight right before going about a casual activity with friends without ever acknowledging it, and the reason is because it's a game and you have a lot of control over their actions. So all of that being said, take a character like Trevor and imagine this story as a movie and remove the player input of hundreds of dead civilians that would undoubtedly attract way more attention than they could possibly handle, and imagine them only doing what they've done in missions. Trevor has done nothing but been completely straight with Franklin, and has never gone behind his back or tried to screw him over nor does he have a history of doing so. In fact, one thing that Trevor values above all else, at least when it comes to his friends or fellow criminals, is loyalty. He won't just randomly kill his friends. He randomly kills civilians, drifters, and people he isn't connected to, but Trevor is a very emotional person. And even if he did snap, he would likely hate himself even more for the rest of his life and never get over the guilt. Michael, on the other hand, as Franklin himself says, betrayed just about everyone he ever knew. Something else that's interesting that factors into my thinking is that the ending where we kill Trevor, Michael is willing to help Franklin do it. In this mission though, when Franklin tells Trevor that he plans to kill Mike, Trevor is disgusted by Franklin's lack of loyalty to his friend, and never speaks to him again, refusing to help. So we drive out to somewhere quiet and remote to meet Michael, and, well, I'm gonna let you guys watch these cutscenes in their entirety because they're quite powerful. Hey man. Hey, what's up? You seem kinda agitated. Man, shit ain't good right now. I'm sorry to hear that. Hold on. Hey, baby, what's up? Really? Tracy? College? Our Tracy? R real college? You gotta be kidding me. That's great. All right, well, hey, listen, let me talk to you a little later, all right? Yeah, I just gotta wrap up some business here. All right, bye. Ah, uh, Amanda. Says she wants me to bring you around the house sometime for dinner. One of these nights, huh? Fuck. I mean, I don't know what I did to deserve this motherfucking luck. I got my kids back, my wife, got a job that I love. I mean, I made it. We made it. You and me, bro. <laughs> what? I like you, dog, and you know this. I risked everything for your ass, dawg. What is this? Look, man. Me and you know this shit ain't over, dawg. We both realists. The fuck is this? You... You? You came here to fucking clip me? You? Fuck! And then we chase Michael to this oil refinery facility, or whatever this is, and chase him all the way up to the top of one of these towers for a scene that actually made me tear up a bit, and the first of our three endings. Oh, shit. Come on, you prick. I taught you everything you know. Not everything. I was here long before you, and I'll be here after your ass. Well, we'll see about that. Fuck. I'll take you every time. Every fucking time! Yeah? Fucking A right! You man! I was your bitch! I couldn't even stand down the barrel of your gun any fucking day, you motherfucker! You just keep telling yourself that. It ain't gonna make you feel any better. Past performance, homie. People don't fucking change. You did. You. Two-bit gangster gone three-bit. And now you're gonna... Gap. The only one who was ever decent to you. Ha! No. I trusted you. I took you in. Treated you like family. Ha! Mike, let's just fuck you. You also get the choice to let Michael go here or try to save him one last time, but it's too late. The ending is the same. What a 
up? What up? This your boy LD. Leave one. Hey, Lamar. It's me, homie. Look, I was just calling to see how you was doing, dog. Or maybe we can hang out or something. Man, I know I've been kind of caught up in shit, man, but shit been real crazy, homie. But it's dealt with now. Fuck, man, you know how it is, homie. You just start running and shit, and all of a sudden your legs give and you just can't run no more. Anyway, man, man, just hit me, dog. We brothers, homie, all right? Peace. So that's our first ending. Now let's see what happens when we instead choose to kill Trevor. So again, keeping in mind everything I said about Trevor and Michael in the context of the game, let's see how this goes. Hey man, how you doing? Shit, I'm good, T. And yourself? <sighs> Peachy! I know what this is about. You do? Of course! It's Michael! You're the peacemaker! Well, I ain't having it, alright? I ain't having it. I mean, maybe when the heat dies down. But this, nah, I ain't having. I mean, that's it, right? Huh? Wasn't it? Wasn't it? But Michael ain't the problem. T, I like you. You scare the shit out of me sometimes. You creep me the fuck out. But, but the way I see it, the way anyone normal will see it, not that any of this shit is normal, man, you gonna get us all fucking killed. You gonna whack me? Huh? Me? I ain't been nothing but straight and true with you. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, you have been true with me. But the truth ain't what I'm interested in. You fucking shoot him! Then, just like before, we chase Trevor, this time out to the oil fields in the east side, and eventually... you grow the fuck up. I mean, I admit, I'm a bad piece of work, but that guy, that piece of shit, no boundaries, no sense of when to back off, no nothing. 24-7 insanity, day in, day out, all the time. He never regretted nothing, never cared for nothing. Well, fuck him. I mean, there's gotta be a limit, kid. You know, a point where even assholes like us say, enough is he fucking enough. Human stew. That's my limit. I know that now. I guess that's that then. It is what it is. Hey! It's certainly been an education. Surviving is winning, Franklin. Everything else is bullshit. 
fairy tales spun by people afraid to look life in the eye. Whatever it takes, kid. Survive. Like I said, Michael does help Franklin do the job, but he does at the very least not seem to take pleasure in killing Trevor, even if he doesn't cut ties with Franklin because of it like T does. Watching either Mike or Trevor die is really weird, in a way that I don't think I've seen replicated in many games. It's definitely in part because of the incredible performances of all three actors, Stephen Ogg, Ned Luke, and Sean Fenteno, but both of these endings are truly hard to watch, and at the least in a video game, wholly unsatisfying, and they're supposed to be. If GTA V was a movie though, I honestly think the ending where Michael dies might have been more impactful since in that context, keeping all three alive so you can still play as them would not be a factor. But now, for the much more satisfying and video game appropriate as well as officially canonical ending, option C, the Death Wish. So this time, instead of phoning either Mike or Trevor, Franklin phones Lester and asks him for his advice, but amazingly, Lester's first, hesitant answer is to kill Michael and then kill Trevor. Incidentally, I think it's weird we didn't get a fourth ending where Franklin kills them both because that also feels like it would have made sense, but I gotta disagree with Lester. If Franklin had gone that route, I think it would make a whole lot more sense to kill Trevor first, since Trevor at the very least has a chance of taking revenge for Mike's death, while Michael would never do the same for T. Eventually though, Lester comes up with a better plan. Lure Merriweather, who worked for Devon and the FIB, into a trap by making them think that the gold we just stole is about to be smelted down in the foundry on the edge of town. But a finale wouldn't be complete without help from your boy LD, so before we head to the foundry to meet Mike and Trevor, we gotta go collect our best bud. At the foundry, Franklin takes control and gives T&M marching orders, after they finally stop aiming their guns at each other, and then we're launched into the first part of our final mission, the holdout. This fight isn't as intense as the end of the obvious approach for the big score, I don't think, but it is pretty damn intense. We can choose to fight as any of the three protagonists here, which is a feature that I wish had been present in more missions. But eventually, we have to head outside to help Lamar hold down the fort, and then clean up the remainders with a little help from my friend Mr. Minigun. Once Merriweather and the FIB are dealt with, it's time to plan a coordinated strike on our actual targets, which are, by this point, quite numerous. Once Merriweather and the FIB are dealt with, it's time to plan a coordinated strike on our actual targets, which are, by this point, quite numerous. So we have to take out Steve Haynes, Devin Weston, Wei Chang, and even Stretch, since apparently he's a loose end even though he can't be the only one gunning for Lamar's ass in the hood, so I'm not really sure what adding him to the list accomplishes. It's not like he knew about the heist or anything. So now we have to take each of them out as the protagonist that's least connected to that antagonist. So Michael takes out Stretch, Trevor takes out Steve, and Franklin takes out Wei Chang, and then all three of us take out Weston. Steve is easy, just snipe him as he's filming an episode of his TV show down at the pier and then lose the cops. I decided to keep up the sniper method for Stretch too since normally I get up right in his business. And then it's over to Franklin to take out Wei Cheng where... Uh, God damn it. Anyway, take out Wei Cheng and then escape the remaining triads and that's it, we're almost done. Only one target left to eliminate and we all know who that is. Back with Trevor, we are given our last gameplay choice with how we go about reaching Devon. You can slowly and methodically take out his guards and then walk up to him scaring the shit out of him, but as much fun as that is, subtlety is not really Trevor's strong suit, so... Ow. I guess Devin bought a bulletproof towel basket or whatever the heck you call this thing though, because I tried shooting him from over here and he was just fine. His car is also apparently bulletproof. Grab Weston, toss him in the trunk, and then make our final drive to the shore as Devin desperately pleads with Trevor to let him out. We get to the spot, and Trevor mentions they have some alone time before Frank and Mike get there, but we never actually see what he does to him. But he does look quite a bit more bruised than the one punch would have done, before we finally see him again for the last time. Hey, we good, T? Never better, amigo. Franklin? I'll be here. <laughs> Franklin. Hey, what's up? I assume you got him? Ooh, safe and sound. Ain't that right, buddy? <laughs> hey, my bad, homie. I pick C. Ain't that a bitch? You know, Devin, the way I see it, and hey, I'm no intelligent businessman like you, but the way I see it, 
There's two great evils that bedevil American capitalism, the type that you practice. Number one is outsourcing. You paid a private company to do your dirty work for you. And then you underpaid that company because you thought you were big enough and bad enough that you didn't have to play by the rules. Oh, number two, offshoring your profits. Offshore? Oh, it's horrible. You wouldn't want to be sent offshore just to save a little money, would you, T? Oh, no, Franklin? I wouldn't. Oh, no, I ain't would going you nowhere. No, see, but we know your opinions on the matter, Devin. Keep your problems the fuck out of America, huh? <laughs> In this instance, when he puts it like that, it makes sense. Of course it does. Hey, Devin, goodbye, my old friend. Thanks for all the advice. Bye-bye. So now what? Now we keep a low profile and get on with our lives. As friends. Well, do I have a choice? No, not really. All right, then. As uh, flawed, awful, totally uncomfortable, and poorly matched friends. Absolutely. Oh, that's perfect. Then we can get back to the kind of capitalism we practice. Shit, I don't know how much more better that is than Devin's con. Ooh, hypocrisy, Franklin. Civilization's greatest virtue. Jesus, your therapist has a lot to answer for. I know, I still hate myself. But hey, at least I know the words for it now. Yeah, but I hate you, and I know the words for it. So does that mean I don't have to go to therapy? Look, man, you two motherfuckers terrify me of that middle age. I'm good. You're right to be afraid, Franklin. Yeah. Be very afraid, Franklin. Tell you one thing, T. I'm getting too old for this nonsense. Oh. But the game isn't technically over. There are two types of 100% for this game as far as I'm concerned, the normal 100% and the true 100%, since the game only considers Franklin's missions and side activities in case players choose ending A or B. So a true 100% playthrough would do all side activities for all three characters, but even if I wasn't trying to get this video out in a timely manner, I wouldn't be doing that. Maybe some people will give me shit for this while still evaluating the game, but the reality is very few people are completionists and I'm not trying to force myself to play that way when it's never been my style. Grand Theft Auto is also the kind of game where I do not mind at all leaving myself things to do in the post-game if I want to, since just spending time in this game's world is a lot of fun by itself. Plus, a good cathartic rampage never gets old. In the post-game, though, we can actually do quite a bit now, since we have at least $30 million for each protagonist, and the first thing that I did was to finish the two assassination missions and invest in the appropriate stocks to give myself just a little bit more spending money, even if I never spend it. The fourth assassination mission is another simple one where we have to kill a billionaire who is so stingy that he still takes the bus to work, which also presents the perfect opportunity to kill him. Now, I know I have said in this video that it annoys me when the game does things that don't seem very appropriate for a game called Grand Theft Auto, like making us drive dock cranes or hunt animals, but, and call me a hypocrite, I kinda wish there was a bus side mission alongside the taxi ones like we got in the old games. I mean, I understand why the Vigilante, Firefighter, and other such side missions were cut, even if I wish they weren't, but... One of the biggest appeals of Grand Theft Auto for me was always driving a whole bunch of different kinds of automobiles. I know, shocker. And a freaking dock crane is really stretching the definition of automobile. Now, while I'm not going for 100%, I wanted to spend a few more hours with the game after the finale to complete some leftover side missions, listen to some more of the radio stations, and soak in the last of the LS sun before I finally get ready to move on from San Andreas for a while. I hung out with Lamar as Trevor, which I didn't know you could do, and also remembered that darts was a thing in this game, as well as it's a lot harder than it was in 4. By now, I was also able to complete the next mission for Michael's Epsilon thread with Delivering the Truth, which sees us flying this baby blue plane to Sandy Shores Airfield. Remember though, kids, just because the mission is basically over doesn't mean you can't go out of your way to fail it. Then it was time for our fifth and final assassination mission, and it's a big one, or rather a very cinematic one. Unlike most of our previous missions, this one pretty much always goes the same up to a certain point. 
We have to take out a guy who is heavily guarded by security at the top of the Mile High Club where we were supposed to follow the architect earlier. So this one ends up being a more typical mission structure. Just cut through all the dude's guards and go up to the two separate elevators for a final fight on the roof where the target tries to escape via helicopter. If you came at all prepared though, well, he doesn't have a great chance at escape. And once he's done, there's only one way off the building and I think we all know what that is. And then, in my final session with this game for this playthrough, I just tackled a whole bunch of side activities and started with a couple that I've been ignoring of Trevor's. The first one was to do with this guy Josh Bernstein, who is a disgraced real estate agent that wants to take his competition, or rather former competition, down a few pegs. So he tells Trevor if he destroys the signs of Lenny Avery, who I gotta think is a reference to Avery Carrington, who is also a big real estate guy, well then Trevor can have a bit of bouncy bouncy as he puts it with a very beautiful woman. Now, Trevor doesn't even seem initially all that motivated by this offer, but more so just by being chaotic in general. Conveniently, while destroying Avery signs, I run into another Strangers and Freaks missions of Trevor's that I've been avoiding, Nigel and Mrs. Thornhill. These two nut jobs are something else. Two older folks from Great Britain who met online and formed a bond over their shared, unhealthy obsession with Vinewood celebrities. Trevor being Trevor, he more than happily agrees to help the couple acquire some rather rare celebrity memorabilia, and these missions are often just pretty amusing since you can actually kill the celebrity in question if you want to. Our first victim is actually another reference to the 3D era, which serves to confuse people who don't understand the whole parallel universe bit, since Love Fist is here. Well, the bass player anyway. We have to acquire Willie McTavish here's gold tooth by beating the crap out of him, and I have to shoot him too, but actually, when the news bulletin plays later upon completion, we learn that somehow Willie survives that shotgun blast. So I guess my efforts to deprive Love Fist fans of a reunion tour didn't pan out. Our second celebrity is Tyler Dixon, who is lounging in the pool with some of his girlfriends. I end up killing one of his girlfriends, but the stealth mechanics only work sometimes, so he instantly hears the silenced shot and I end up shooting him too, before grabbing the bag full of clothes and getting the hell out of there in his nice shiny red comet. Then we gotta steal the golf club of Mark Faustenberg, but the cops don't actually have an easy time getting inside the golf course, and you only get two stars in these missions when killing the celebs, so... And then there's only one left to go before the equally strange finale. Finally, we nab the dog collar of Carrie, whatever her name is, and get to witness a glorious sequence of a dog running through the streets causing way more chaos than even we usually can thanks to the magic of scripting. After taking this fire truck nearby, I decided to continue with the rampages next for Trevor, which means giving the Ballas a visit near Grove Street, before finally going back to see Josh. When we do eventually destroy all 15 Lenny Avery signs, since the game is generous enough to provide you an in-game map to avoid searching, then you meet Josh at a motel, and he actually follows through with his offer. We never actually see the mysterious woman, but assume that Trevor is at least satisfied, since this will not be the last job that we do for Mr. Bernstein here. Now he wants us to go to Rockford Hills, find Lenny Avery, and intimidate him into getting out of the business. I still have the fire truck that I stole too, so I ended up nearly crunching his green comet against the wall. Too bad the damage physics got dialed back since 4 thanks to first person mode though. Oh, and by this point I had also started buying up all the properties I neglected to purchase earlier in the game when I had very little money, and so now Trevor owned Tequilala on Vinewood Boulevard. Now, some of the properties will occasionally ask you to do little jobs to keep them profitable. As I was coming up the road on my way to do another mission, I spotted paparazzi apparently trying to leave my fine establishment with some photos they should not have. So I dealt with them exactly how Trevor would, and was paid for it in my profits that week. Where was I going? Why, to the next Rampage mission against the freaking military. Wait a minute. The military is literally in this game. All the vehicles we'd expect in previous games, so why the hell did we lose the 6-star wanted level and tanks coming after us? Oh, and I can't remember if we've talked about it before, but the reason for each Rampage is that some group insults Trevor using the word motherfucker, and or notices his very slight Canadian accent, which he is very sensitive about. This Rampage is probably my favorite, if only because they give you a freaking grenade launcher. Then it was time to do the next Civil Border Patrol mission where we find Joe and Joseph's truck sitting seemingly abandoned on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. Apparently they were using it as... bait, I guess? And as luck would have it, for them, as they realize it's actually just Trevor again, somebody rides by, and somehow, instantly, they know that they're illegals. I guess maybe they were doing a stakeout, but I don't really know. So, same as before, we gotta chase down the guy and then let Joe and Joseph tase and detain him. Then we gotta drive out to another location and detain two more dudes, both on bikes this time, and once they're in, the Joes just leave us in the middle of the desert because they're such great guys. And then, for the first part of the two-part finale to the Nigel and Mrs. Thornhill thread, this time we have to chase Al DiNapoli through the city until he eventually crashes through a freaking hospital, and we can then catch him and toss him in the trunk to do you know, whatever they're going to do with him. 
I find it funny that despite the fact that we follow him out the side of the hospital in our car, the cutscene shows the car looking like it was parked normally there, meaning it was either an oversight or Trevor canonically made the smoothest landing imaginable. Then I finally completed the rampages with the last one in Mirror Park, the target, hipsters, and then switched back to Michael to do the most tedious mission in the Epsilon thread, which involves unironically running through the game's desert for five miles without exiting an invisible circle, which, if you do accidentally step outside of, will reset your progress. So then, I definitely did that completely legitimately and without taking any shortcuts, which eventually results in two calls directly from Chris Formage himself. This also unlocks the next and final Epsilon mission, but before doing that, I bought a bunch more properties for Franklin and Trevor, did another stock car race, and then did another of Dom's missions, Liquidity Risk. This one involves riding an ATV onto and then out of an airplane, and I guess Dom's original intention was to somehow land while still being on the ATV, but... I'm not exactly sure how that would have worked. We ditch them and land normally on the beach where Dom takes off on a jet ski, but I decided to have a little fun when the mission finished and saved before Dom could leave, allowing me to do this. But then it was time to visit Chris and complete the Epsilon missions with unknowing the truth. We drive down to the Epsilon headquarters, which I believe is based on a real Church of Scientology headquarters building in LA, and then finally get to see Chris Formage in person for the first time. He was another character from the days of GTA San Andreas, but we'd only ever heard his voice in-game. He had never been given an in-game model as far as I know. This mission is simple, but the interesting part is the choice you're given. Chris asks you to drive a car with a lot of your own money and money from other saps like Michael to be picked up and brought to the airport, where it will then be flown out to the Cayman Islands. As soon as you're given control though, you can just drive away and fight off the Epsilon dudes to keep all the money for yourself. If you do this before the big one, the amount might actually be worth it, and I didn't bother looking it up, but since Michael had become dedicated enough to walk through the desert for hours in pajamas, I figured it didn't make a whole lot of sense for him to abandon the whole thing in the end for an amount of money that was paltry to him. So we deliver the money and are given our ultimate reward. You're going to be P-U-M-P pumped! Keflon! Back with Trevor, it was time to wrap up another thread with Minuteman Blues, where one of the guys we arrested in a previous mission guilts Trevor into making it right, and we are finally given the opportunity to kill Joe and Joseph. Joseph you find beating up a perp outside, and you can use the taser gun on him to give him a taste of his own medicine, but Joe is scripted to burst out of this barn and try to make a run for it. Kinda hard to run from a minigun in the tractor though. And yet more threads to wrap up after that with part 2 to the Aldenapoli kidnapping, which we pulled for this lovely couple earlier. They can't figure out what to do with the guy and ask Trevor to make a call, so we take him, still stuffed in the trunk of their car, and we can either let him go at any point or drive him to the train tracks to let nature do its thing. What do you think I did? Now, it would have been nice if the next mission was also wrapping up a thread to keep the momentum going here, but alas, it's only the penultimate mission for the Josh Bernstein story. This time we gotta go back to the first house where we met Josh, which is apparently his, and burn it down by using the underused gasoline trail mechanic. After it blows up, we gotta escape the cops, but the next time we hear from Josh, we'll finally get a proper resolution. Speaking of penultimate missions, I next did the second-to-last Dom mission where you have to jump off the Maze Bank building and land on a moving truck below. When you land, though, Dom fails to do the same and is very pissed off that you managed to beat him. So he challenges us to one more jump at the Land Act Reservoir, but there's a catch that the game doesn't tell you explicitly. You have to do all 13 parachute jumps in order to do that, and I'm writing this on September 15th, two days before the anniversary when I hope to release this video, so unfortunately, I just don't have time to do them all. We're not missing that much though. The final mission for him is just being led by that dog again to the Land Act Reservoir, where Dom does his final jump and we don't even have to kill him. The game does it for us. But our next and final Strangers and Freaks mission, and our final mission, is one that's kind of like an easter egg or a small reward for players who continue to play past the ending. After beating the main story, eventually, when you come back to Trevor's trailer, he'll be greeted by... his mother. <laughs> So, you've done well for yourself. What? what? What are you doing here? Is that how you greet your mother, Trevor? I, 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 I didn't know they let you out. So you never wrote to me? You never visited? 
Well, I... I bet you never found a girl. Tell me, Trevor, are you gay? No. Is that what this is all about? No. I wouldn't care. In fact, I've always wanted a gay son. A son who wouldn't forget about his mother. But Ma! But Ma, but Ma, but Ma, nothing. Not a peep. I carried you in here. I fed you. I weaned you. Now look at you. You always were an ungrateful, wretched, sniveling sack of shit of a boy. You know it, and I know it. There was always something wrong with you. Ashamed of yourself, ashamed of me, of your own mother. I've been here for hours, and have you gotten me a drink, or a cigarette, or massage my feet? I'm an old woman, and you, in the prime of life, have you nothing inside? I'm so sorry. I... <laughs> there, there, it's okay, son. <laughs> oh, that's enough. <laughs> Here I am, old and tired and alone. I'm so sorry for everything. Exactly, for everything. I'm an old woman, Trevor. I don't got no insurance. Oh, I got money! I don't want your goddamn money! Is that what you think I am? A prostitute? Still? You're sick. What can I do? I'm in a lot of pain. I need you to get me some more Deludamol. I can do that. A lot of them. A truckload, literally. And not those weedy little ones. The thousand milligram ones. And if you find me a gentleman, well, we both know you need a father figure. Then we gotta find her a dilutamol van, which can be found near hospitals and pharmacies, and once we do, drive it back to the trailer to find. But with all of this money, I realized something pretty quickly. You don't actually have anywhere close to enough storage for even a fraction of the vehicles in the game. In the base game of GTA 5, there are probably like 100 cars, plus the tanks, helicopters, planes, and other shit that you can buy, and even if you have a garage and a helipad for all three characters, you can still only store like 6 cars in those garages, even though you can store an infinite number of special vehicles and aircraft I think too. In fact, let's talk about how cars work in general, because I've got some gripes that go all the way back to the old games that still hadn't been addressed when GTA 5 came out. In story mode, there is no good reason to ever spend your money on cars, especially modifying them with the exception of the protagonist's personal vehicles. When doing missions, 99% of the time the game will put you in a personal vehicle or whatever vehicle the mission requires you to use, and just like in the old games, if you bring the cars that you bought and customized to missions, then expect for them to disappear all the time, along with all the money that you spent on them. Like, remember that Duke of Death? Yeah, I assumed that was a special vehicle like the branded muscle cars that you can win at the stock races, but no, it's not. So when I left it to do other things, it just vanished. Even if you could store an infinite number of vehicles and missions didn't force you to use your personal vehicle, you still don't have any convenient way to get to your vehicle collection, which is made all the more baffling and frustrating when you realize they do have that in GTA Online, and it's been around since the very beginning. Why couldn't we have a mechanic like an Online and be able to call our fleet of vehicles? Why can't we access them through our interaction menu? The game goes out of its way to discourage you from using a wide variety of vehicles for anything other than brief periods as you move from objective to objective. Now in a way this is actually more true to the idea of Grand Theft Auto, I mean these days in GTA Online it's more like freaking Grand Buy Auto, but imagine if you could just steal a car off the road, bring it to LS Customs and make it yours. Like at least in story mode, why the hell not? Maybe put some light restrictions on it, but this is just disappointing, especially because there are so many fun cars to drive that you just might never get the chance to. 
So let's briefly talk about the soundtrack and radio stations in GTA 5, because much like every GTA game before it, this game has an absolutely fantastic selection of tracks from a wide variety of artists. And especially now being 10 years old, it serves as a time capsule, much like Vice City or San Andreas did before it, even if they were trying to evoke a time that was already old when they released. Now we get something new. These games serve as a little slice of the way that the culture was at the time of their release, and GTA 5 just oozes the 2010s vibes out of every orifice. Rap stations, classic rock, reggae, talk radio, both city-based and more rural stuff, pop music, club music, electronic music, punk, hard rock, and a little bit of just about everything you could want, unless you're like a hardcore Slayer fan or something. Something else that makes a return that really hadn't been seen since GTA 3 that you may or may not have known is a metric ton of original songs recorded specifically for GTA 5 to really help sell this as a real world. Tracks like Welcome to Los Santos, Nine is God, Smokin' and Ridin', What's Next, The Setup, and Hold Up, among many others, were all commissioned for this game's release, and even I didn't know that for half of them until researching for this video. Separate from the radio stations, though, is the actual original soundtrack, and while GTA 4 had some of that, 5 was the first time we got a fully fleshed out and original soundtrack that would accompany missions and fill the void when the radio stations couldn't or weren't being used. These tracks were composed by a variety of artists, including Woody Jackson, Oh No, The Alchemist, and the incredible Tangerine Dream, and it pretty perfectly fits the vibes the game is going for, very similar to the original music made for Ballad of Gay Tony, which had a similar, if more, East Coast vibe. The open worlds of Grand Theft Auto games are easily my favorite part, though, in any given title, and the state of San Andreas in GTA V is an absolute blast to explore and just exist in. There is an often overwhelming number of activities to do, many of which have absolutely nothing to do with stealing cars or getting into gunfights, and that's both a criticism and a praise, since some days I like it and some days I just wish there was a bit more that was directly related to our central theme. Biking, yoga, cable cars, hunting, darts, drinking, golfing, tennis, racing, parachuting, exploring the ocean floor. There are just so many things to do in this game that are wholly separate from the main story missions, and probably more overall than any other GTA game before it. There is an attention to detail in the pedestrians, shop names, street layouts, and more that really make this world feel real, and go a long way in immersing you into the experience. There were also so many areas of this map that had tons of love poured into them that will probably never be seen by 99% of players, but just as much effort was put into these spots as the places you will go to again and again. My biggest gripe with GTA 5's map would probably be how mountainous it can be though, not because the real California isn't similar, but because of how effectively much of the map is unnavigable or just flat out empty. The Strangers and Freaks missions in this game, as I'm pretty sure I mentioned before, are often fun but also feel completely out of left field a lot, in a way that often takes me out of the world, which wouldn't be a problem if the game always embraced its own absurdity, but just as often as it wants to be ridiculous and over the top, GTA 5 also wants to be brooding and serious, but not quite serious enough to please the hardcore GTA 4 fans who want nothing but misery. Calm down y'all, 4 is my favorite too, but you guys are way too up your own asses about it. Speaking of 4, the gunplay in 5 is also significantly better than anything we've had in previous titles, and especially since you can play the entire game either in first or third person, with custom animations made for every single action performed in first person, making for almost two completely separate experiences, and for me anyway, increasing replay value. The cars and vehicles overall handle a lot better than GTA 4, but as a result feel a lot less real, which again was a big appeal to a lot of people who love GTA 4's driving. Something I will agree with them on though is the lack of crazy deformation physics on cars, which is actually only that way because of the problems that leaving that deformation would present for first person gameplay. Imagine you're driving a car and crash it in such a way that your view is now clipped by your roof. But that's Grand Theft Auto V 10 years later. How does it hold up? Well, for me, the answer is really well. Now, keep in mind, I am evaluating GTA V single player as a single product. I am not including the things that we lost because of online or anything about what online has done to the game's industry in my evaluation. I am only looking at what we got in a bubble, and what we got is still pretty damn incredible. If anything, GTA V feels a lot more like a sequel to GTA San Andreas than I ever realized before. Much like that game, I think my biggest gripe with GTA V is not the story, or that it was bad, but that it feels like it needed just a little bit more time to flesh out its story beats. GTA 5 also has a fair bit of GTA San Andreas' issue of having too much to do sometimes that isn't really appealing to the average person who plays a GTA game. Wildlife photography, yoga, exploring the ocean floor, these are not things I associate with GTA, and yet they are all here. 
I would have much preferred that the time and resources spent on making things like the Yoga minigame were instead put into giving us a few more missions to flesh out Stretch or Wei Chang as antagonists, or just in general devote more time to Franklin's story, since he ends up taking a backseat to the main event of Michael and Trevor's looming confrontation over what happens in the game's introduction. That is probably my second biggest issue with GTA V. Franklin doesn't get the attention that Michael and Trevor do, and instead ends up having his story finished by the online team who were so out of ideas that they just decided to make Franklin marry Tanisha despite the entire game making it clear that she didn't want that and that Franklin was meant to learn something from that. Then there's the heists. It really feels like the game needed two or three more heists to flesh out the concept. I mean, for fuck's sakes, we only got paid for four out of the five heists, and Trevor only participates in three of them, which really feels like a wasted opportunity. I feel like there should have been a couple heists in between the Meriwether one and the Bureau raid, instead of just one, or that we should have been given options in Blitz play or Monkey Business, or even the various Devon West and Car missions, but we didn't get any of that. The concepts GTA V introduces feel like they get more attention than a lot of the new things they tried back in San Andreas, but it does still occasionally give off the feeling of being ever so slightly lacking. Oh yeah, and then there's the scripting. Look, scripting sequences in games isn't bad on its own by any means, but the problem is that GTA games in the past often prided themselves on doing exactly the opposite. You're given an objective and have to find a way to get it done, but you would have a lot of freedom in how you went about that. Something that is still present in this game, don't get me wrong, but the times when the game forces you to do exactly what it wants while you should be able to do it your way are far more numerous than in GTA 4 or even San Andreas, both of which also had plenty of scripted sequences. Beyond these gripes, Grand Theft Auto V is an incredible game. The story is more lighthearted than 4's, but still very engaging. The three protagonist gimmick is a lot of fun and very unique. The world feels more alive and reactive than ever before, and the visuals, for me anyway, still hold up pretty damn well even after all these years. Not being too realistic that it looks awkward to look back on like with GTA 4, although for some of the non-cutscene models like Packy, that isn't always the case. There is still an insane amount of fun to be had just escaping a wanted level in GTA 5, or driving around the world causing chaos, or even just exploring. And even though GTA 4 is narratively my favorite game in the series, I enjoy the gameplay of 5 just a little bit better, even if I wish it was a little bit less reliant on scripting. Alright, trophy time. First up we have the all-time favorite award. It almost feels wrong to give this trophy because of the GTA 4 people who have drilled into my head for years that GTA 5 just can't even be compared to 4, but I've never felt that. Even if I like 4 better, and this isn't about objectivity, it's about my experiences, and I love this game. I think most of my biggest issues with GTA 5 come back to what GTA Online has done to it, and that's a whole separate video in and of itself. But looking at GTA 5's story mode on its own, I have a blast playing it every time and I have played it many times over the last 10 years, so to give it anything less I feel would be a disservice. Next up, we have the Longest Credits Ever Award, because god damn, the credits for this game are, I kid you not, 45 minutes long. I walked away to make food, to do some shit around the house, and they were still not done. A lot of people worked on this game, and I can only imagine that the credits for GTA 6 are going to be longer than the actual game based on this, but I don't think I've ever seen a game with longer credits. If you know of one, let me know in the comments. And finally, we have the Three Amigos Award. The chemistry between Steven Ogg, Sean Fenteno, and Ned Luke is absolutely fantastic, and combined with the amazing Slink Johnson as Lamar, they really do sell the three protagonists gimmick and make it really something that makes this game stand out as unique, both gameplay-wise and narratively speaking. There aren't a lot of games that give you three different characters that you can swap between in a world of this scale. In fact, I don't know of any that do anything like this to this degree outside of RPGs, but even in most of those, your other characters do not seem to continue living their lives independent of your actions when you don't control them. Well, that's about it for Grand Theft Auto V. This game has been incredibly important to my life, if only because it's part of what I do now for a living, and I would be lying if I said it hasn't affected how I look at it. GTA V has been out for 10 years now. A full decade ago, I sat down in front of my last CRT TV and played this game on my Xbox 360, and 10 years later, we're still waiting for a new entry into the franchise, and expectations are, at this point, ridiculously high. I'm releasing this on the actual 10th anniversary, and I am, writing this now, really hoping and maybe even expecting some kind of reveal, maybe even a teaser to mark this special occasion, so who knows? Maybe you're watching this after the GTA 6 trailer, just getting one last rhyme with Los Santos before it's finally time to start heading back to the sunny beaches of my favorite setting in the GTA universe, Vice City. Well, even if when watching this we still don't know anything new, I think I'm ready to finally put this game away for a while with the conclusion of this episode. I definitely will come back to it one day, and maybe by then, GTA 6 will be out and everybody will be talking about how much better this game is actually than that one. Thank you for joining me on this nostalgic look back at one of the most important video games ever. But don't get too comfortable, 
The next episode might just throw you for a loop as it's specifically requested by a patron. And with that, I am happy to announce the new tier for my Patreon, Walker Villain. For anybody who wants me to cover a specific game for the Game Vault that's nostalgic to you. Now, I always plan to cover all the games that I played growing up, so if it's something that I already played, you can have me do the episode earlier, but I would prefer games that I've never played before, since there are still quite a few, even big-name games, that I simply never touched, like Dead Space, or up until very recently, the Mafia games, even. So, for $100 Canadian, or about $75 American, you can choose an episode of the Game Vault on anything you want. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Guinness Walker for details. Anyway, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end, and I'll see you in the next episode, which will be on a game that I've never played before. You'll have to stay tuned to find out what it is, though, so be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you know exactly when the next video releases. Have yourselves a wonderful evening. I'm Guinness Walker, and I'll see you all next time on The Game Vault. Game Vault